Welcome everybody uh, to this course, EU Integration and Essex, kindly supported by, by the European Commission. And we are going to start our course with the following example. Uh, actually, our example is not as nice as this picture, which was taken in a local school uh, in Innsbruck. Uh, the example is the following. Imagine you are standing to a track uh, where there is a trolley car hurtling down uh, quite fast. And uh, all of a sudden you realize that there are certain workers uh, standing on that track. And uh, let's assume, and let's take this for sure, let's just assume that you cannot save the life of those uh, five workers. And let's assume that they would be killed uh, if the trolley car hits them. So actually you're quite desperate uh, because you know that they are going to die and that there, there is nothing that you can do. Unless all of a sudden uh, you realize that there is a side track. And uh, on that side track is only one person standing. And let's also assume that you know for sure that also this person would be killed. And after that you realize that, that there is a, a lever and you can pull the lever. And by doing that you can actually redirect the trolley car from the main track to the side track. Okay, so you have the decision to not to interfere and then the five workers would be killed or you have the pos possibility to interfere and then the five workers or people uh, standing on the main track would be saved but the one person on the side track would be killed. What's the right thing to do? So who would keep the trolley car going straight ahead which means that you don't interfere and who would redirect, who would take an active decision, re redirect the trolley car to the side track uh, and therefore save the five but kill the one. So who would keep the trolley car going straight uh, ahead? One, okay, two, three, four, <laughs> some kind of group, group pressure. <laughs> <coughs> and who would uh, turn the trolley car to the side track? Okay, that seems clear. Or that is clearly uh, the big majority. <coughs> Could I uh, now hear from first of all those who uh, opted for the first uh, possibility? What what were the what were your arguments or what what uh, were your ideas why you opted for the first possibility? My argument is that um, if you do anything. That's the destiny, that's, that's life, but if you decide to turn the, the trolley, yeah. it's like killing someone. From okay, so if I got it right, uh, and I just, on, just only don't need to, to repeat it for, for the camera, for the mic, but also just to, 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 get to be sure that I got your, your point. So your point is that uh, it's rather the fact that it's an active decision, which uh, creates some unease. Uh, therefore you say, okay, if I don't interfere, then I'm not involved in the situation. Uh, maybe I cannot be blamed. That can be related to that. And uh, that's why he opted for the first possibility. Is that right? Yeah. Kind of. One, one, I decide that it's not right, it's the life, that's blah, blah. And if I decide to turn it, yeah, I'm involved in the decision and yeah. it's like I feel it. Yeah. You will see that in this course we're going to have a look at different perspectives always. Uh, and one perspective uh, is obviously the legal perspective. And uh, for the legal perspective, uh, the question now to you, is it only, for example, in criminal law that you can be blamed when taking an active decision or also if you have not taken a decision? What's the answer? Well, when, whenever there is a situation where you can help someone and you're not doing that, you can still be... Exactly, so if there's someone lying on the floor uh, needing medical of, uh, assistance, first aid, if you don't help that person, at least uh, under Austrian criminal law, uh, you could be held responsible. Okay, so just to get the, p I, I get, got your point and obviously it's, uh, um, the, the, the question to which extent you're involved is a very important issue, but still just to, to clarify it, that even if you don't act, you could be held responsible. Like wrong to kill 
even though the purpose of killing him is to save more people's lives, okay. the action itself is still wrong. Okay, so uh, there, there were several elements in your statement. Uh, so the purpose uh, and the action. So those are two components which we, we sometimes might to differentiate. Uh, but why, why was your point that, uh, that the person on the side track is innocent? Uh, does that mean that the five workers on the main track, that they are not innocent? Are yeah. So again, the point that you actively yeah, well take the I decision. Yeah, the combination of both. Like, as a society, we cannot just because there's less casualty if they make this decision. So we go to kill that one person in the elements because it's big, it's bad for most people. Does that make sense? Okay, so that, that I guess, uh, but I would like to to know from all, all of you. I guess that the fact that it's five versus one. Uh, could yeah, be. It's not, it's not the number that okay. The okay. So you say that the number uh, of people that uh, that can be uh, saved. So th that does not matter. What about those who who voted uh, according to the, or the majority of of you? Yeah. If you really think about those things, I guess that if it was really destiny, there wouldn't be any other possibility to change. If the destiny was only to kill the five people, there wouldn't be another option to yeah. change it. Okay, destiny, that would go to, uh, uh, I would inter interpret it this way, that goes a little bit towards uh, religion. Yeah. So maybe it was just foreseen, uh, no, no matter which religion uh, you follow, uh, or you might not follow. We will come back to, uh, as I said, we are going to take a look at different perspectives, law, uh, philosophy, uh, also religion will be uh, one part, but rather at the end of our course, in the afternoon. But if we let, uh, put aside uh, destiny for the moment, uh, then I think the main argument for the majority of you, but I stand here to be corrected, was that uh, it's better to save five uh, and only kill one. Although I assume that uh, all of you stated would the best situation <laughs> would be to save everyone, but that's the, the moral dilemma that we face here. And so at least, so to say, uh, we can save five and only kill one. So what about the rest of the majority? Was that the, ma the major point for all of you? Kind of? Yes? Any other arguments of the majority, but al but also of the minority? You cannot weigh one life versus five lives. You cannot say one life is worth more than five lives. Yeah. Why not? Just uh, as a provocative <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah, you could say it's for the greater good if to save five lives, but yeah. still, I think I'm not in a position if I'm standing there to choose whether five lives are worth more than one. Yeah. Do you agree to that statement? And still, as a second question, my uh, my question would then be: as we point, as we discussed it earlier, the decision not to take a decision isn't that isn't that also a decision in itself? But what about uh, the point that she addressed that uh, we should not put uh, a certain value on lives by deciding that the the life of one person. Uh, or five person uh, is worth more than the life of the one on the side track. What about this argument? Do you agree? Disagree? Uh, no, I, I disagree. I think in a situation like this, you need to think about damage control. Damage control? Yeah. Yeah. Um, people will die anyways. Um, so now it's up to you if uh, the train you're driving is going to take five lives or one. So just to make the best out of the situation as it stands. As we as I also emphasized that you cannot change the situation as such. Like, like you said, the decision will be done anyway. So you decide to uh, go straight or you decide to um, take the side. Yeah. Okay. 
What about the others? Is it correct or is it okay on whatever level, religion, uh, on the legal perspective, uh, from a moral perspective, is it okay to value life? I actually have a legal question. Yeah? Is it deemed an accident both ways? So if he continues to drive straight, is that's obviously an accident, right? He's accidentally hit them. But if he chooses to change the course, legally, is he still held to an accident? Or is it now that he's legally responsible for this accident or for this occurrence? Well, we have to differentiate because, and there are different uh, variations of this uh, famous trolley car uh, dilemma or example. So, obviously, there might be some person which uh, kind of started the trolley car, no matter whether the person is still sitting inside or so we could think about a lot of different situations. So, of course, that person or let's say the company as such could be held responsible. Yes, that depends on, on the circumstances of the case. Uh, in, in, uh, in this picture, uh, the trolley car is already arriving, so we, we, I may again refer to, to destiny or, or, or accident, uh, if you like to call it uh, like this. And then you have the decision to intervene, and again also the decision not to intervene is a decision in itself. Uh, and then your decision is whether the five are killed or the one. I don't know, you're coming from the US? Yeah. yeah? <laughs> so uh, why? are you referring to this notion of accident? What, what legal implications does that have? Because we always need to translate those terms into a different legal uh, system. Um, accident meaning like you had technically no control of what happened, you didn't interfere at all because you didn't know your options, you yeah. just kind of let it happen. And then not being an accident, um, I don't know what you all should no. call it, but it would be like a trauma, it'd be like something that you called to happen, whether it's for the greater good or not, but you're yeah. held legally responsible more for that than you are the accident. Okay, if I, I just I hope I, I translate that concept correctly into what we find in most uh, European countries. So that would be the question of fault, which can play a role. And also here we need to differentiate different perspectives, both in criminal law and in private law. In criminal law, now put very bluntly, that would be the question whether you go to jail uh, if you are at fault. So that's the one issue. Uh, the other issue or the other perspective would be uh, civil or private law where it's about compensation of damages and for compensation of damages on average or normally you always have four different prerequisites. Does any one of you know? What are the four classical prerequisites uh, so that A has to compensate the damage of B? Does any one of you know? Well, the easier one obviously you need the damage, yeah? That can, can be that uh, uh, something you own is damaged or that you are damaged uh, <coughs> so that your health uh, uh, is affected. So a damage, what else do we need? Yeah, we need a damage, then we need uh, a breach of law. So there has to be some act or omission which is deemed to be illegal. So damage, breach of law. Uh, we need a causality, meaning that it was this action which resulted into the damage. For example, if I take a football, place it here and kick it onto the camera and then the camera is broken, then my action or kicking the football on the camera was causal for the damage of, I don't know how many euros, uh, what, the what it cost to re repair the camera or to buy a new one. So the damage... Uh, the breach of law, a link of causality, and the last one, and now we are here back to our example, that's, uh, that there is some element of fault, or in, so now in your terms that, it, that it's no accident, so that uh, you can be blamed, to put it this way, and those are normally the four prerequisites for uh, compensation of damages. There are some exceptions, but on average uh, it's always those four classical prerequisites. So, would you uh, damage, breach of law, causality, caus causal link, and uh, some element of fault. Now, going back to our example, and I would like to come back to uh, the statement that you gave. So, 
your point was basically, or your point was, uh, it's not okay uh, to value the life uh, of five higher than the life of one. So what we have heard here, this kind of mathematical approach, uh, it's we cannot change the situation as such, but the best we can do is to save the life of five because it's higher than uh, than uh, the one work on the side track. What's, what's the right approach to this dilemma? There's no right or wrong. There's no <laughs> um, I don't know, ethics theories, like yeah. utilitarianism, yeah. you save the five for the greater good. Yeah. Or you say, kind of, I don't know, um, categorical imperative, for example, you save probably the one because the action of actively killing the other five would be wrong. So. Yeah. So we already have some yeah. background knowledge, uh, uh, philosophical approaches to, to this dilemma. And again, a dilemma as such, the word means that there is no ideal situation. Uh, so it's not like creating uh, a win-win situation, so that's not possible. It's just uh, the possibility to choose from the, the best situation uh, possible. But uh, dilemma always means that the, there are no win-win situations. Yeah? Those of you who uh, decided uh, to save uh, the life of, of the five, because it's, they are more, uh, could you imagine any circumstances, if we take that as a principle, that if we, for the moment being, agree to the uh, majority, we should save the life of the five, could you think of any situations uh, where you would kind of make an exception to that rule? When of the five person. Okay, if you just know them, yeah? Yep, if you personally know them, yeah? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was going to say If uh, the other person is, I don't know. Maybe if that's your fiancé, your mother, uh, a child, yeah? Any other exception? Children involved, maybe? Children as such, so not your own children, or not children to whom you are uh, related, but any children, yeah? Okay. Yeah, same idea. Same children, yeah? Okay, so uh, <laughs> where are you coming from? Okay. Uh, so if we uh, if I try to categorize it, so children might be a kind of an objective reason, and we can s see if there are other objective reasons. War, uh, I think that's more subjective, that depends on which side you're on. Uh, so could you give me other examples of more objective, if I may classify it like this, and more subjective reasons? Maybe that's why people have like, I don't know, late age cancer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that, w uh, that would be an objective reason, but the a reason not to save them, but to kill them. If they're go going to die anyway, then <laughs> rather save someone else. Maybe if the five people are rich people and you're interested in saving them and their, their money or something. <laughs> <laughs> but, but would you save the rich uh, <laughs> persons because... Maybe, maybe if I save their lives, they're going to give me some money. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, uh, we can... So saving uh, someone who is rich because he would then, or it's <laughs> more likely that he would uh, uh, pay, uh, donate some money to you uh, in order to thank you. Uh, I think we can classify that as a very subjective reason, yeah? <laughs> if you agree. If they are criminals, like murderers or... Yeah, if they are criminals? Yeah. And then... Yeah, well, if, there are, if, one, if one is a criminal, I'll go for one. Yeah. What what might be the challenge uh, for for that reason? Maybe you can see um, that he's a criminal now because he wears uh, certain clothes, but you don't know what he did. What yeah, and apart from that, we say value life again. Sorry. Value life again. That's again, you value life, yeah. But but we always value life here. So in whether someone is maybe. Uh, 
from a country having war against your country. Maybe he or she is from another political party. Uh, he's from another region of the country. Can anything that we can that we can imagine here? You can say for sure that the others are no criminals. Yeah. So there is some element of doubt. So we, we might not be sure. What's a legal problem to uh, taking the fact, and there can be some uncertainty <laughs> that uh, <coughs> some or one uh, or several persons are criminals. Uh, what's a legal problem <coughs> if we take that as a reason uh, into our decision making? They could be wrongly accused. They could be wrongly accused. Accused plus. Well, the government's property. I mean, you're uh, anyway. No, it's the, I mean, that's their property. It's they get to choose what happens to those people. Yeah, the government. The problem is you're playing kind of a judge role, and therefore you're not allowed normally. Exactly. Uh, if you don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. So even though we might have the problem of uncertainty, uh, even if we know for sure, uh, if there is no doubt, absolutely no doubt that that person may be on the side track, or all five on, on the main track uh, is or are criminals. Uh, still, it's not our role to decide, and it, it's not even the role of the government, but it's, and we'll come back to that later on, it's the role of judges uh, in, in our legal system to decide on that. Plus, we might have another legal uh, issue, depending on in which country uh, that situation takes place. But we would have a legal issue if that situation takes place in Europe. What am I... Am I Pointing to? I think the problem is that you are doing it on purpose, so therefore you are responsible for the decision. Exactly, so that's, uh, that's unlike for, uh, for a judge. So if a judge sends someone to jail and if all uh, formalities have been met, then of course uh, there is no problem for the judge. Uh, but what problem would we have in Europe if we take the decision to kill the criminal? Any ideas? Exactly, so we don't have death penalty in, in Europe uh, and that would even for a judge be a, a legal issue. So we have the uncertainty <coughs> issue, we have the fact that it's not the task of any citizen and not even of the government, of parliament, but of judges. And again, we're coming back to that issue later on. Uh, that's an issue and last but not least, uh, uh, we have the right to life, so or in, 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 in other way, in other way around. Uh, the abolition of death penalty, and, and therefore that would be another reason. Yeah. So we've seen there could be a lot of uh, objective or subjective uh, criteria to decide into the one or the other situation. Now you point already pointed out uh, to possible limitations of utilitarian approaches. As I said, just deciding on uh, the biggest number that can be saved or the smallest number that would be uh, killed. Uh, has anyone of you seen that uh, film on, was broadcasted on Austrian, German and uh, Swiss television on the same day? And actually it's based on a theater play. Uh, it's called Terror, Your Judgment. Has anyone of you seen it? Yeah? What was it about? Let's say 100 passengers, innocent passengers in an airplane, yeah? Yeah, well, and they um, threatened to steer that plane into a football stadium that was yeah. filled with, I don't know, like... 10,000, yeah. And there was a... <coughs> and there's this uh, pilot who's on trial because he had um, the chance to shoot down the plane. And so so we have the, the, the innocent, the, the aircraft with the innocent passengers. And we have a tactical fighter which is behind that airplane. And then we talk about this pilot who has the possibility to shoot down the first uh, aircraft. Yeah? Yeah, so, and, and I think he actually did that. I'm not quite sure, actually. Uh, so he, he has the chance to kill the innocent people in the plane and save the people in the stadium, or he could have done nothing. 
like in our trolley car example, and if it did nothing, then uh, the aircraft would crash into the stadium, yeah? yeah? Now, comparing the second example to the first one, you see the differences. The, so uh, even, if, even if the airplane hits the football stadium, the 100 people on the airplane dies anyway. Okay, so that's one difference, yeah? But apart from that, so uh, rather referring to the reasons why you've chosen for the one or for the other, uh, possibility? I think it depends that he has got the order to do it, so we can say that it's naturally his, um, his involvement in the decision. Because the order is given by the army. Okay, so if we have the, the pilot now in the second, uh, in the tactical fighter, uh, again here we could uh, imagine two situations. It's someone down on the ground. Uh, a general of the army, for, for instance, of the Air Force, telling him to shoot down uh, the aircraft or he takes the decision on, on himself. And then again, it could be that uh, he assumed that that would be okay because he was told and in that such situations that uh, would be okay. Or it could be that he is clearly acting against orders that were given to him uh, beforehand. You mean, uh, so here we have two players, two stakeholders, uh, uh, which are strongly linked to each other, whereas uh, for the trolley car example, we only have uh, you standing there and either you pull the lever or not, and therefore it's uh, your decision only. Yeah? Yeah. Apart from those differences, so that here, uh, if the airplane with the innocent pas passengers crashes into the stadium, all would be killed, most likely. Uh, apart from this and from apart from your point, are there any other arguments, or would you say no? The situation basically is still quite similar. Maybe there was still uh, a small chance that the plane will um, fly somewhere else, and that there yeah. was Okay, S but for those kind of uh, dilemma situations, we always try to uh, exclude uh, <laughs> variations, which kind of destroy the, the theoretical problem. Apart from that. So, uh, well, we could still discuss about destiny, but the accident argument uh, does not count here because it's, uh, it was a clear act. And what we also would differentiate on the innocent, uh, or on this airplane, the crew, the pilot, we would deem them to be innocent, uh, all the passengers, and uh, maybe you have a different uh, attitude towards uh, the kidnappers. Uh, but they would be a minority, maybe only five, uh, and as I said, 100 innocent passengers plus the innocent crew. So if I may summarize it, uh, first example, second example, your evaluation of the situation would be quite similar. Just as you pointed out, there are some differences in, in, in terms of the, the facts of the example. As I said, if the airplane uh, crashes into the stadium, all would be killed, those in the stadium plus those on the aircraft. Okay. If we move on, kind of modifying now the, f the first or the first two examples, imagine the following situation. You have a hospital and uh, we have one patient who is ill, but he still has uh, four functioning organs. And now we can decide which organs. Uh, if we take out those four organs of a patient which is ill already, but the four organs, they are properly <coughs> functioning, we could save the life of four other patients, always giving one organ to one other patient. So if we would take out <coughs> four organs of this one patient who is in hospital. By doing so, we could save the life of four others. But obviously, if he lacks four organs, uh, the one pa uh, patient would die. Same situation, or is it different? Because the doctor cannot, cannot harm any, any, any patient. Yeah. So he cannot just kill one to, to help four. Yeah. So he, has, he cannot do that. So doctor, you argue, is different to someone standing coincidentally uh, at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at this track 
So uh, there's a difference in the moral assessment of what a person does or, was not, or does not do uh, if it's just anyone or if it's a doctor who is constrained by certain principles or you tell me. No, because they swear on not harming anyone. Yeah, okay. So they cannot do it. Well, if they do it, they... Okay, do due it. to the oath that uh, he had to, to, to make, uh, that keeps him from taking the decision to yank out the organs of uh, the, th the four organs of the one patient and, and mm -hmm. save the life of the four, of four others. Well, yeah, it's just one option, it's just not doing anything. Yeah. Yeah, I also think this case is different <coughs> than the previous one. Maybe there would be another um, possibility to save the lives of the others without killing one. Yeah. Le again, just to get to the point, let's assume there is no other option, yeah? Yeah. So he could obviously that patient, uh, and that again <coughs> that depends on the medical law in that country where it takes place, maybe could take the decision to donate his organs, but uh, that would be a special situation of donation because if he donates them, uh, he would that means that he would die. So it's kind of element of suicide. Um, but here the question is not whether the, the patient would be allowed to donate his organs. That's a different issue that we could discuss. But whether the medical doctor uh, could or should they take this decision. Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask, is the patient voluntarily like, donating his organs? If no, then like, definitely cannot do it. Because if we think this action is right, I mean, the whole population would be in if we take, if we allow such uh, decisions, yeah. If we yeah. Allow such thing happens, what what would be the consequence? Because like everyone can be killed yeah. as long as it's for saving other people's. Yeah. Lives. So no one would dare to go to a hospital because you never know. Uh, <laughs> you might just have a flu, uh, <laughs> and in the end you might not survive it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that would be a practical consequence, but more in terms of arguing why the one or the other is the the right or the wrong uh, decision. Yeah, quite, quite the same. So the person who takes the decision is not anyone, but it's a medical doctor. He's in a special situation. He had a special kind of training. Uh, he uh, also uh, had to swear that uh, he always does the best for his patients. Uh, but then still, if we take that oath, couldn't that doctor argue? Well, I'm, sa I'm helping for the same argument that we had before. If I, if my oath included the fact that I ha have to help patients, in, wha in which way is it different to our trolley car example? He would save the life of four, uh, four patients. His profession because he also, must, uh, he must save not five or one, but six lives. So therefore, no opportunity. But then he would just uh, yes. go to the coffee machine, have a coffee, and <laughs> relax. <laughs> <laughs> or help others. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> help others, th but then uh, again we, are, we, we face the, the legal challenge that <coughs> he cannot only be accused based on act, but also based on omission, that he did not interfere. But not because that Sorry. collides with his, his, like his vows, I don't know how to say it. Because his oaths, yeah. Yeah, his oaths. Because legally if he, if he kills one, say four, he's actually just killing one. And that goes absolutely mm. the wrong side of what he, he swore. But my point is just, uh, if you take this utilitarian approach, that it's always better to save a bigger number of humans instead of a smaller number, what's the difference? And, and the first two examples are actually quite similar, but if we take them together, what's the difference to, uh, to this uh, medical example? What's the difference? Isn't it also about just uh, comparing numbers, or is it in any way different? I think it's different because the patient can give a consent before, so it's not accidentally happening. So you could regulate it before. Yeah, and, and that's what we have in a lot of countries that, so either an opt-in or an opt-out situation, so you have to uh, opt-in, you have to de decide, yes, uh, 
in case that, that I die, uh, my organs, which can still be of use, if, if I may put it this way, can be donated. Uh, so opting in or opting out that uh, unless you act uh, uh, actively opt out, uh, it would be assumed that everyone uh, is an organ donor. And as you might know, we have different uh, legal situations in different countries. Uh, but still, it, it could be that not on uh, by giving your personal consent, but by just having a medical law in a country, that the situation would be the following. If uh, a bigger number of patients can be saved, then the law decides that that situation could take place. Yeah, well, I think the difference is because the first two cases are like not doing anything, but letting those people die. And the yeah. last case is like actually take the action to kill. So the mm -hmm. last case is actually an active. Yeah. Action. So although I told you that uh, action and omission, so acting and not acting, uh, could result in uh, your legal responsibility. But still, it seems that taking an active uh, action seems more to be wrong than uh, not to, to act. I give you uh, another variation. Let's go back in history, in ancient Roman times. Uh, and some of you are from Italy. Yeah, There's three of you, four of you. Uh, imagine Roman Colosseum at the time uh, and so the Romans were throwing uh, some Christians to the lions just for overall amusement so nowadays we go to the cinema or uh, to a football game uh, did not exist at the time so let's just throw some Christians to the lions five Christians for the overall amusement of I don't know how many people uh, could uh, enter the, the Colosseum at the time Different, right decision, or was it different to our previous examples? And if yes, in which way is it different? It's different because no one will be saved. Okay. Someone is born in the no one will be saved, yeah. <laughs> Maybe you could argue that the lions will be saved or they are not hungry <laughs> anymore, yeah? <laughs> so that would, if we take that as an advantage and the disadvantage that f uh, five of them are killed, lucky lions. Why not? Clearly wrong, for me at least. Clearly wrong. But the lions uh, were not hungry afterwards. And I don't know how many people fit into the Colosseum. 3,000 Romans. They, they were uh, very pleased and uh, lucky afterwards. Doesn't it count to be lucky or happy? For me, the difference is that the balance is not the same. It's not life for life, it's life for punishment. Okay. So we have different stakes that, uh, that play a role in, in, in this example. So it's life uh, versus uh, amusement. Uh, and I would agree that's a big uh, difference because in the previous example it was always about the life of a certain number of human beings versus uh, the life of a smaller number of human beings. Here it's about uh, life or death of the minority versus the amusement of the majority, yeah? And so I think that's a, a very important difference. <coughs> Maybe that could be considered also a, uh, like a form of advertising, like to keep the control and to make the people, like the population understand that Christianism isn't, wasn't considered good. Yeah. So if you become Christian, that's the end of you will do. Okay, so that you would say that's like a, a warning of the government. If you ch uh, choose uh, the wrong religion, then that's, uh, we tell you how you're going to end up. Yeah. yeah? I think in this case, the Christians were kind of prisoners. Yeah. And therefore, back in the time future, uh, they were no humans, they were things. And yeah. things are, it's like food for the lions. Yeah. So whether we the take the meat of cows or the meat of, of Christian, doesn't matter. <coughs> this kind in this of time, yeah. And what else comes to your mind if we, if you bring those arguments? Racial issues. Sorry. Racial issues. Issues. So the system and black and white 
Yeah. Better who's not yeah. So nowadays, but at the time, obviously slavery. So the point that you made, uh, although we consider someone to be a human being, but for whatever reasons, if you are legally qualified as being a slave, then uh, uh, legally speaking, you're not a human being, but you are a thing, and therefore you could be thrown to the lions like any, anything else. Yeah? Talking about Roman times, the question is if that's all just a very theoretical, uh, philosophical uh, reasoning or whether uh, that also might play a role uh, nowadays. And you all know about uh, self-driving cars. And for self-driving cars, we also uh, often have this dilemma. What, what's the dilemma that might arise in this situation? <laughs> in which way? Uh, it's just um, the computer doesn't have the answer, so it's not programmed on do that or do the other thing. But? It's just... Uh, um, Randomly. Yeah. Randomly. Yeah. Randomly. Yeah. Let's just for the moment being exclude uh, the, the, the information for the computer that you should just randomly choose. Let's just exclude that possibility. Let's just assume uh, the computer should take uh, a certain decision. Uh, what would be the dilemma? What do you assume? So how I think um, he's meant to save the passengers. Okay, so one uh, dilemma could be uh, should the car sacrifice the passengers or the pedestrians? What could be another dilemma? And by the way, uh, what do you think uh, if we take the first dilemma, passengers versus pedestrians? What's the very likely situation uh, that the manufacturers would uh, go for? I mean, the pedestrian doesn't didn't have any kind of safety situation or mm -hmm. systems, but the car has airbags on it. And yeah. So if the car decided not to hit the pedestrian, but uh, like hit a tree, and so the passenger could be in danger, so do you think that, that the car, it's more likely that you uh, one day buy a car which uh, sacrifices uh, the, uh, the pedestrians or the, the passengers? Well, I think the manufacturer would definitely go for the life of the passengers. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because <they're> the <laughs> exactly, because they would pay for it and no one would pay for a car uh, where you know that in case uh, you would be the one to die, um, very similar as no one would dare to go to hospital if uh, you know that you would risk uh, losing four organs or at least one and then you would die afterwards. So what you can see here, it's a screenshot taken from uh, MIT, so Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, and you can try it one day if you like. It's moralmachine.mit.edu. And there you can decide, so your personal decision, uh, what's the right option in how a self-driving car should be pro uh, programmed. So you can see here, if it's either that here the pedestrians, uh, so that always indicates who should be killed, if the pedestrian should be killed, first possibility, or if the pedestrian should be saved and all the passengers should be killed. So first ki kind of or category of dilemma. <laughs> there is a uh, second one uh, and here we're coming closer to the argument that you made previously. So to put a, to value uh, life, uh, rich persons uh, and, and others. So should the car either to, uh, decide or children have been named. So here we have children and uh, two mothers or young women. Here we have uh, old women. So should the car decide to kill children and mothers or young women uh, or should the car, uh, as I said, like it was the point of uh, terminally ill cancer patients, for example, should they be killed because we assume or we know, again, a lot of uncertainty if they are going to die very soon. What's the right thing to do? Cheap 
OK, but if, if you say, to, again, you're tr uh, trying to, to uh, destroy the dilemma, if we just put the car here, so it's on its way here, so then uh, you could say it's not like not going straight ahead, but then it, if it goes here, it would decide to kill the one or the other. Could you think of any other dilemma? And obviously, young humans versus older humans is one dilemma. We could uh, then have the challenge of uh, having uh, rich human beings versus uh, purer human beings. We could have criminals. Uh, we could have good-looking humans versus <laughs> more ugly humans. So there are a lot of challenges. And still, the question is the same as at the very beginning of our course. What's the right decision to take? Does anyone of you know from uh, and what they did or what they are doing at Moral and Machine at MIT? They are basically trying to gather uh, decisions of, uh, of users who go to their website and who take a decision. And there are a lot of decisions. For example, you can uh, decide how many cats are as valuable as one human being. <laughs> and then even going one step further, you can say, OK, how many cats are rather worth it to be safe than how many dogs. And so a lot of variations. I think you can even make up your own examples, if you like. So adding a lot of complexity to this dilemma. But still, they are just gathering information to find out what does the majority of people think? What's their attitude? Uh, how should a, uh, a car, a self-driving car, be pro uh, programmed in the future uh, to take rather the one or the other decision? Obviously, always assuming that the car can properly evaluate or assess the information, knowing that those are not three boxes but three cats, and knowing that that's a good-looking or not so good-looking man or woman, that they are older, younger, that they are uh, managers or rather, rather uh, beggars. Obviously, always depends on that kind of situation. Let's now, uh, after this, uh, example, uh, jump into the, let's, let's, uh, let's put it this way, organizational issues of this course. Um, and then we will continue with the example, so we'll just try to lay the ground for everything which will follow afterwards. So what's the objective of this course? The objective of this course is to, uh, as I said, to point out uh, different perspectives. Um, so they say that you get a more holistic approach on certain topics that we're going to discuss. The topics that we're going to discuss are affirmative action, uh, surrogacy, and reproductive uh, technologies as such, the moral limits of markets, and uh, still a very important uh, current topic, migration. Uh, and what I will try to do is uh, to discuss some issues of European Union law as that's the legal system that uh, provides for similar rules uh, in all 28 member states of the European Union, sometimes even beyond. So we're also going to discuss that. And so both to discuss those uh, topics of European Union law and policy, but also uh, to, give, to try to give you more perspective than just a legal perspective. And I'm actually very thankful that we have a very diverse group here because I hope that in the discussion, and so far uh, it, it already proved to be right, uh, having a very diverse group, we can bring in a lot of different uh, perspectives uh, on the different subjects that we are going to discuss. Let me also very briefly, normally you do that at the very beginning of the course, uh, but I wanted to start with this one example. So let me very briefly introduce myself. My name is Markus Frischut. Uh, I've been studying law here uh, in Innsbruck and in France, in Strasbourg uh, at the time. I then uh, did my uh, court internship. And studying in Strasbourg, I also took the opportunity to make an internship in the European Parliament. That's basically why I got hooked on European Union law, because it's uh, 
the one that well, what fascinates me about European Union law is that it's very international. Also working with different languages, uh, I also always found uh, very interesting. Um, and what I'm working on nowadays is uh, basically is revealed it's European Union law as such. I do a lot of European uh, health law and uh, the relationship of law in general or European Union law and ethics, those are uh, basically the three fields uh, that I'm working on. Now, I shouldn't talk too much about myself, but rather about you. Uh, as I said, we are a very uh, international group. Uh, we have, uh, and that's uh, uh, alphabetical order, we have seven Austrians. Could you raise your hand, the Austrians? Yeah, okay. So, Austrians. Three from Brazil, okay, the three ladies. Two from Finland, okay, they're not here. Uh, <laughs> France, okay. Eight from Germany, okay. Italy, the four we've already seen. Lithuania, so a warm welcome to you. Mexico, three times. Okay, warm welcome to you also. We have two times uh, Korea. Yeah. Oh, one, one. Okay, so we have some course overlaps. Spain. <coughs> yeah. Three f Spain. United Kingdom. Uh, and the US. That's two of you. Well, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'm actually Okay, so okay, so that's information I got from. But no, ma no matter where you're coming from, I think it's always a big added value to have a lot as a lot of different uh, backgrounds in terms of what you're studying, but also where you're coming from. And just to talk about MCI students, uh, there are four from tourism. Yeah, okay, tourism, uh, non-profit, yeah, biotechnology. Okay. But, in but in Mexico, okay, we take you as <laughs> expert in this field. Uh, communication and IT, <coughs> two or one. Uh, international health and social management, yes. Mechatronics, mechatronics and management and law. Okay, okay uh, so. Also of MCI students? Yeah. Ah, okay. The two field. Okay, very good. So we also have those perspectives. So having a, a, a very international group is definitely uh, an added value. I also want to point out just to the fact that uh, this course is part of this project here at MCI, uh, which is called Earn Your Digital Badge. There are several digital badges. If you want to know what is a di digital badge, I also updated this link as we have a new website uh, where you can find further information. So I just want to uh, point out that possibility, but I uh, don't want to explain it in details. And there are several, so content-wise, there are several digital badges, and this course is part of the digital badge responsible management. Obviously, uh, there are others also, but just uh, to have it mentioned. Why are the majority of our sessions online? Uh, we've already seen when I uh, introduced you where you're coming from that not all of you can be here today. That's a course which is addressed to everyone here at MCI. So no, no matter whether you're regular students, whether you're incoming students, uh, that course is offered for everyone. So that's why we need some flexibility. That's also why the course is uh, recorded today for those who have uh, uh, course overlaps. So and But even if you're here today, uh, you could still uh, watch uh, the recording afterwards. So uh, my colleague, whom you have seen before, she's uh, putting uh, it then online, and the link will be shared on the Shomone uh, website. So <coughs> there actually, so if this course, and today we are meeting here on site, is a blended learning course, there are different uh, ways of blended learning. So what do you you can see here, face to face, that's what we're doing uh, today. That's our first session, and that's also going to be our last session 
and the one guest lecture that we have. There are different forms of synchronous learning, so taking place at the same time. So as uh, so we're going to have uh, our first online session on affirmative action. So you will sit in front of your computers. Uh, I will be in my office, and then we are going to do this online session. Also, uh, to have the possibility to uh, involve other students. And uh, sorry, I didn't mention it here. Also, a warm welcoming. For example, we have uh, participants from Greece who will never uh, be uh, here on site, but by uh, having the recording and by doing online sessions, we can also. Uh, uh, take in uh, participants who are, let's say, outside MCI. So if I mentioned regular MCI students, incoming students, but even uh, students or other participants outside can participate in, in this course. Um, there is also asynchronous interactive learning. For example, if there are online discussions, uh, if uh, there's some group work uh, that takes place uh, outside, so not at the same time. So uh, that's, that's also one issue, and asynchronous self-paced learning. For example, all the pre-readings that you had to do or have to do for, for the next sessions, there uh, you're just working on your own and only uh, afterwards we will kind of integrate that preparation in our online sessions or also in uh, the presentations that take place uh, in our last meeting. Okay, so I already mentioned that Today's session uh, will be recorded, so also for uh, external participants. Um, the reason why uh, there is some break in between today's session and the first online session is just uh, for our colleague, bec uh, because it takes a lot of time to make the recording, to put it online, and that's the reason uh, why there is a certain gap between today's session and the online session. You should already know that all the course material can be found on Sakai, where you need to log in. For external participants, there is one link uh, where they can directly access the documents, although they are not uh, registered or enrolled here at MCI. As I said, after today's uh, kickoff session, where we're going to lay the ground, uh, the knowledge that you need for the online sessions, and as I also pointed out, that you all have a diff very different background. For this course, there was no formal prerequisite in terms of certain pre-knowledge that you need to have. That's why what we try to establish based on the pre-readings, so that no matter what is your starting point, based on the pre-readings, you ex exactly know what you need, the knowledge that you need for the relevant sessions, and therefore we can integrate uh, a, a bigger number of students. So. The content of the online sessions, uh, that's what I already mentioned uh, before. So for content related online sessions and then uh, one Q&A session, which in the past has been very important for students uh, that they can address all the remaining questions which they have in order then to be well prepared for their uh, uh, presentations. Also there is then a break, still we have the guest lecture. Uh, that you also have some time to prepare your presentations. Here you have uh, the link, but you have it in Sakai anyway, uh, the link to Adobe Connect, which is the, uh, the tool that we're using for all the five uh, online sessions. Again, four of them content-wise, where we're going to work together. The Q&A session, where you are uh, asked to integrate all the, the remaining questions, and you're also warmly invited, and that's a very important message, to address questions during the online sessions, but especially the Q&A session, uh, that should be the possibility for you to get some coaching so that you're then well prepared for the presentations. If I may further elaborate on those uh, online sessions, so what are the objectives uh, and also the reason why we are focusing on those different uh, issues at the interface of law, policy, and, and ethics. If we're going to talk about affirmative action, we are very much going to discuss the concept of fairness. I will explain it today, just like an introduction, but then we're going to dive deeper into this topic of fairness and how we try to determine uh, fairness or a fair solution of, of a situation. Surrogacy. So rent, uh, renting a, a woman's womb uh, for reproductive issues 
similar as our kickoff question, is very much related to uh, the notion of human dignity. You already mentioned one concept of defining or determining human dignity for the trolley car example. We will very much need uh, all today's uh, discussion at the beginning uh, for this session when, it's about when we talk about human dignity. And uh, talking about the European Union, there's a lot you can talk about, but one very uh, core issue of the European Union is the idea of having a s or creating a single European market. So a market where you can freely trade goods, services, capital uh, and so on, where workers can circulate, also students. And what we're going to do uh, in this session is we're going to reflect on the question not only whether there are legal limitations to this single European market, but whether there are also moral limitations uh, to this economic concept of the single European market. Last but not least, an issue which is still uh, very high on the agenda of European countries, migration. We're going to discuss uh, the situation of migration and also here we're going to take or going to contrast the legal situation and an ethical perspective. We're going to do that basically uh, by using a book of a Canadian scholar, Joseph Currens, who has written a book called The Ethics of Immigration, which covers both uh, refugees and uh, migrants. And we're going to take his idea, and it's very important to point out that's not the one and only ethical uh, attitude towards migration. So that's one attitude, one book, but still a very important one, because he's one of the most famous scholars in this field. And what we're going to do uh, in this session, we're going to contrast his ideas that he has elaborated in his book and contrast it with the current situation of EU law as it stands. So just also not only in this case to get the two perspectives of Canada and uh, Europe, but also the legal, the legal perspective and the ethical one. Talking about Canada, heading a little bit south, uh, this year for the first time we're going to have a guest lecture on site uh, on the 26th of April in the morning uh, of a colleague from North Carolina very famous uni university, Dean Harris. So Dean is his first name, uh, that's not his function. He's associate professor for medical law and ethics. And uh, Dean, uh, I first met him at a conference in Riga. He's a very energetic uh, presenter and uh, he's going to give us the US perspective on migration. Still, I, w I assume there is not the one and only uh, perspective or, or attitude of uh, or yeah, attitude of uh, with regards to migration uh, if we talk about the United States but he's going to give us uh, some uh, uh, perspectives from the outside so to say I think uh, will be a very interesting uh, guest lecture and as I said at the end we it's going to get full circled we, we are going to try to put everything together uh, in our last session uh, where we're going to have uh, your presentations. As I said, you all have different backgrounds and I also try to point out at least to uh, the study background of MCI students because that was the information that was available to me. Um, so therefore, it's very important to emphasize that you need to, to prepare what is indicated on Sakai on, on these slides. Still, uh, I don't want to uh, make you buy a book which I have written because you could also deem that to be unethical. So that's the shortest version of EU law that is available. So every s apart from the fact that you don't really earn money with by uh, writing those books, uh, anything which is more comprehensive, you're warmly welcome to use that, okay? Uh, that's the absolute minimum. There is one book which also is available at MCI's libra library which uh, is more <coughs> comprehensive which you also warmly uh, invited to use uh, if you need to prepare or even if you want to go deeper into a certain topic. So again, uh, the concept that we're using here is the concept of the flipped classroom. So it's very important for the success <coughs> of the course 
but especially then also for your presentations that you're well prepared. That's why I clearly indicated what you should prepare for the relevant sessions. And depending on when you downloaded <coughs> this presentation on Sakai, uh, as soon as I, I got the information, I also uploaded, uh, it's actually quite short, the two pre-readings for the guest lecture of Dean Harris. So it's a newspaper article from the New York Times and a short excerpt from uh, one of his books, uh, which you can download from Sakai. So again, that's what you should prepare for the relevant sessions. As I said, at the end, we're going to put, try to put everything together uh, in your uh, presentations. Um, should there be someone, and I know already from three of you, uh, that he or she cannot attend uh, the last session online, uh, sorry, the last on-site session, because there is a course overlap, if, if there's just a small course overlap, I will try to manage uh, the, the, the order of your presentation so that we can avoid those course overlaps. If any one of you should not be able to uh, participate at all, then he or she could also go for a reflection paper, similar as those external participants, so if, for example, someone from Greece, or we had also uh, uh, attendance from Africa and from other countries, uh, Romania in the past, so then you can write a reflection paper, which for me, and in terms of what is expected, is equal to the presentations. Expectation management, so that you know how you're going to be graded. Uh, there is a rubric on presentations, also one on reflection paper. I'm not going to explain it in detail, just read through it. Uh, and you can always ask questions, especially also in the Q&A session, so if there is any uh, question what you are expected to do or how you are expected to do it so to be graded in the best way possible, go through it uh, and you can always ask me in between. Maybe just to summarize all that information and to point out to what is the, the key uh, element for me uh, when talking about your, both your presentations or reflection paper, the key element for me is the following, and that's also why today we have this content introduction on the basics. It's not only that you, uh, that you attend, but you should always try to integrate everything which we are doing, for example, today, and then on also in the online sessions, integrate that into your presentations or reflection paper. So, therefore, the pre-readings that I just mentioned, for me that's kind of like the first step. And what you should not do in a presentation, in a reflection paper, just copy-paste information which is already stated there, because for me that's no added value. There is a second step, sorry, there's a second step, which is all the discussions, uh, the worksheets, so everything that we're doing, especially today and in the, in the online sessions. So that's kind of like the second step. So also here we're trying to create an added value. It's not about repeating that information, it's rather it's the, the prerequisite for all the discussions which you're going to have, but still you should then try to make the next step, a, a third step, so to say, you should try to create an added value, something new in comparison to the first uh, two steps. And if I just may point out one element of those rubrics you have just seen, stated here, students apply excellent structure in that a logical sequence of ideas and transitions is demonstrated throughout clearly recognizable central message. So that's just one, of one element from those rubrics uh, that I want to emphasize uh, in for, for, for your presentations or reflection papers. As I still don't know how many, uh, if I know from three students who have some overlaps who cannot make presentation. So depending on the actual number, we're going to roughly maybe have uh, four groups of four students. But again, that we will see. Um, oh, again, also depending on the number of presentations we're going to have, uh, either or no matter uh, what it's going to look like in the end, uh, presentation should be rather short and precise. So it's also uh, clearly uh, the bigger challenge to make a very short and precise presentation instead of a very long presentation. So that will also be taken into account. Um, if you need further information, uh, I 
always try to summarize the most important current events on, on Twitter. You can find it there. And although it's also mentioned uh, in the rubric, I want to point out, as it's mentioned there, <coughs> how you present does not really matter. If you use a flip chart, PowerPoint, Brezi, whatever. So it's more important that uh, you create this added value, but how you do it, so the content is more important, the way how you present your ideas uh, should just serve the purpose. If you use a flip chart and if you can really create this added value, take this third step, then the flip chart is perfectly fine for me. You don't, make to pay, don't have to have a PowerPoint presentation. But anything is possible. Um, try to think right from the beginning based on the pre-readings, based on what we're doing today and then in the online sessions this week to reflect on what would be uh, a possible idea for a presentation. Also, no, always now uh, during breaks, uh, you can approach me and I can help you to shape uh, the idea for a presentation. Uh, as I said, I need to structure it a little bit. That's why I kindly ask you to send me an email by the end of this week, so this Friday, uh, by indicating the planned topic or t even more concrete title of your presentation. Similar as for a paper, the research question, so what you want to try to answer. And uh, a very short description, two, three sentences, just that I know uh, what you have in mind. And then I can uh, <coughs> help you to structure it a little bit. Also to uh, maybe if there are two presentations on a similar topic, to make sure that you are maybe working on two issues which are slightly different. And maybe I can even uh, help you with some uh, readings, uh, some literature that I have in mind that helps you in uh, preparing a good presentation. And again, I would like to point out to the Q&A session, which we're going to have next Tuesday, which has the main purpose of helping you to ma make a good presentation. So if you wish, uh, uh, when we have our presentations, I'm the bad guy, uh, cop because I am going to grade you. In our last online session, I'm going to be the good cop because I'm going to help you uh, to make a good presentation. Online sessions. Having the chance to have you all here, uh, I want to emphasize some key issues of uh, having an online course. Who of you uh, already uh, had online courses? Raise your hand. Okay, some of you. Uh, who was using Adobe Connect? Okay, so that's the tool which seems to be uh, most commonly used. As an etiquette, so to say, uh, first of all, please use uh, Google Chrome. So that's the browser which has been uh, recommended by, uh, by our uh, learning solutions department. Similar as in an uh, on-site course, please switch off uh, your, micro, uh, your, uh, your mobile phones. And I will then always ask you if you can hear me by just uh, here indicating the raise hand button and then I just know that you can hear me. You can see. Uh, I might ask you if you agree or disagree uh, on a certain issue. Uh, if you have to leave uh, the, uh, the computer, just please indicate by step away. If I speak too silently, you can ask me to sp speak louder or more softer, to s slow down, slow up. So <laughs> we might not need all of those uh, tools, <laughs> but uh, at least the raised hand we're going to need at the beginning. Um, if you also while uh, you will see it, it will be a combination of uh, input from my side, group work or, or surveys. Um, if you have an urgent question or a problem, you can also raise your hand. Maybe if there is a chat function available at that moment, you could also uh, uh, address that in the chat. Just make sure that while I'm talking, uh, I might not al always be able to answer immediately. So if an urgent question by raising your hand would be the best way to indicate that. Once, for example, a question has been uh, answered, always make sure that you clear the status, so you lower your hand, so to say, otherwise I assume that there is still an issue, uh, and just to, to make that clear. As I said, during the chat I might not be able to uh, answer it immediately, and what you please should do, and I'll show you that later on, Always be in the room, 
the link that has been indicated roughly te at, or at least 10 minutes before the session starts, so 10, 10 minutes to uh, 5, so that you can check if everything is well functioning. And then I will welcome you, uh, start uh, the session, and I will also record the session so that uh, you can then afterwards, uh, for example, if someone can not, uh, not attend one session or if you need to repeat the session because it's very important for your presentation, then uh, it's recorded so it's still available for you. The audio setup wizard. Uh, what you have, re and that's really, I need to emphasize, that's uh, the most important prerequisite for the online sessions, apart from being well prepared, is to have a functioning headset. I mean, if you have a microphone uh, uh, and loudspeakers, that will also work, but you just need to make sure that although you're sitting somewhere in front of your laptop, we uh, can hear you and that you can speak to the group or to me as you can do it here uh, on site. Okay? That's very important. So make sure that there are no technical issues. So always at the beginning run the audio setup wizard. So that's what you should do in the 10 minutes uh, before uh, we start and at 5 p.m. sharp. And you also need to activate your audio uh, so that uh, for example, when you receive the microphone, that's me as a, as a, as a manager in, in this tool, that you can also uh, then talk to the others. Seems to be quite uh, obvious, but make sure that you are in a quiet place. So for example, if you are down in the first floor, uh, because there's some uh, free spaces, uh, if the people talking behind you, that's very disturbing uh, for all the others in this online room. So try, really try to have a quiet place. And also very important, technically, you should try to have a good an internet connection. Sitting in, uh, in an internet cafe uh, or in a student's dormitory where you already know that there, there's a very bad internet connection, uh, that might cause some problems. And what we also know from our IT or learning solutions department is the fact that if you have a, a firewall on your computer, that's especially for those students who are studying part-time, who have the, the corporate uh, laptops, who have strong security uh, safeguards and firewalls, that's uh, almost a guarantee that it will cause some problems uh, during especially the breakout sessions uh, and therefore try to make sure because that's nothing that I can influence in the very moment. So really you try to make sure that those technical issues uh, are all well functioning. Breakout sessions, I just mentioned it. Um, you will be, that was one option today for the self-driving cars. You will also be randomly uh, allocated to different groups. Uh, if we have maybe three group works during one session, then it would always be the same people, the same colleagues that you would work uh, in, in one session. If the next day we have the next online session, that's again newly, randomly allocated. Um, just again, it has already been mentioned, but just to highlight again uh, what you need to do at the beginning. At the beginning here, so that's the student's view, uh, if there is meeting, here you have to run the audio setup wizard. Okay, so that's very important. Otherwise, you might not be able to hear or to speak, also to contribute to the group. So that's the first issue. Second one, uh, you have to connect your audio. So you can see here, that means that you uh, can listen to the others. Then here you have, to, if you want to speak, for example, if I uh, address you and say, uh, could you please now give you a statement, then I give you the microphone. Then here you have also to connect uh, your microphone. So although it's technically working, you still have to activate it. And that's the third one that you can see, that's the raise your hand. So just make sure that at the beginning, in the 10 minutes, everything is set up properly. Questions? I have a suggestion because I, I did it several times. Yeah. Yeah. Talk yeah. We were 12 people and yeah. it was very noisy. So I okay. Thanks for the, uh, that suggestion and for that experience. 
what I would uh, always do, if, for example, I give you the microphone, you make a statement. Once I ask you, are you, are you finished? Or is there anything you want to add? No. I would deactivate your microphone so you wouldn't have it anyway. But, uh, for example, if you're working in a group, in a group, and I'm very thankful that you point out to, to this issue, uh, you could either uh, use more the chat function or you could uh, rather talk to each other. Depending on the size of the group, uh, you need to have some uh, rules who is talking. If everyone is talking at the same time, uh, it doesn't work. What I've experienced for some uh, meetings that were taking, uh, on taking place online was that everyone says, now I am Marcus and now I'm taking the microphone. So just by this introductory sentence might sound stupid, but it really helps to have some order. As you said, if everyone is talking at the same time, similar as here, uh, it doesn't work. But thank you very much for, for sharing that experience. Any other questions now? Organizational questions? Technical questions? Again, I think uh, should have everything should be well described. If there are no questions from your side, we're going, yeah? Is paper also a, uh, a teamwork? Or can paper, no, paper that's single, so that's uh, only. No, the, uh, I can show you. Uh, yeah, the date for the reflection paper is later, and the, as I said, and that's very important uh, to emphasize, MCI students uh, should make a presentation. Only as an exception, if that is, for a good reason, it's not possible. If someone goes for a reflection paper, still I want to make it very clear that for me, the level of expectation for presentation and reflection paper is the same. Also the fact, for example, that if someone who cannot attend uh, on our last on-site session, you could say, well, he uh, has the advantage of one day where he can go skiing. No, because that one day, uh, you would definitely need more time to do the reflection paper, to do all the proper research. Also, the presentation should be uh, well elaborated. But I know from experience that uh, the fact that you don't, that you save one day, so to say, uh, but means that one or even more days go into the preparation of the reflection paper, but that's for one person only. Presentations will always be group work. Other questions? For, uh, for the presentations, uh, if you select uh, one of the topics that we are going to discuss here, for example, if you say, uh, in my country, uh, just one example, affirmative action is a very big issue. I know some current uh, examples which are very interesting. Uh, now, maybe I'm, I'm coming from the US. I now have heard what, what's that like in, in Europe. And now I'm going to contrast the US situation with the European situation. Just one possibility. Or, for example, if we focus on affirmative action, uh, concerning uh, access to universities and ethnic background. Maybe you say, no, I want to uh, uh, work on affirmative action when it comes to equal treatment of men and women at the workplace or anything. So just to... So you should uh, provide the facts and you should also uh, present your uh, opinion. Of course, you should always make clear what are the facts, what is your opinion. I think we need a break, but if there is um, still... So we can now choose a topic outside from those presented in the... Well, that w that's what you should uh, check uh, with me, uh, for example, during the break. If a topic is closely related to those topics, but obviously if a topic is very far, or, or not really linked to what we're doing here, it cannot be a topic for presentation for this course. But again, that's what you can discuss uh, during the break. No, uh, as I said, uh, until uh, Friday uh, this week, you should uh, um, write me an email indicating the planned topic, so more broader, the title, so already narrowing it a little bit down, the question that you want to try to answer, uh, short description, just that I have an idea what you're going to uh, present, and obviously the names of the, the participants, uh, 
but before sending me the email, it would always be good to, uh, to, to get feedback so that you know, okay, uh, that's a good topic or for whatever reason, that's uh, uh, a topic that you should rather not choose. So we are choosing the members. You are setting up the group, exactly. Maybe you get to know each other better uh, uh, at the coffee machine. Let's have a break of 15 minutes and then we continue. We started this course with uh, this kickoff question, the trolley car example, which I modified in, in several ways. Then we stepped out of this presentation uh, just to give you the organizational uh, information, also the technical issues. Uh, maybe just to add, because there was a, a question during the break, uh, smartphones are definitely not ideal to be used by Adobe Connect. I don't know if anyone who has already done an online course can confirm, but for several reasons, uh, smartphones are definitely not the ideal situation on, in terms of how to participate in an online course. As you can see, apart from the kickoff question, uh, that's what we are going to do today in the morning, roughly until the quarter, uh, quarter past 12. And then we're going to continue at half past one with those topics. Again, those topics are, are kind of the basis, the, the, the foundation that we need then both for the online session so that you are well familiar in terms of what we're going to discuss there, but also especially then for presentations or eventually a reflection paper, that's always the basis which you should then also integrate in whatever way it, it, it is of relevance for your specific topic. Here I have collected some examples uh, and I would ask you which of those examples, just the headings, uh, you would qualify as being law. We're going to do this law in general. And, and thanks for your question. I have on purpose not yet defined law. So I'm going to do that afterwards. But just what you would qualify as law. And we're going to do it in uh, the following way. Now, not for the online sessions, but now, if uh, available, uh, please use your smartphones or any other electronic devices and access the following website. I have, while you're doing that, uh, I have to tell you that this way of uh, making the survey is anonymous, so I cannot trace back uh, who is given which information, so uh, don't feel constrained by the fear of eventually giving uh, the wrong answer. So if you just go uh, to this website and uh, there you can enter a code so that it then would display the question that I still need to activate. And uh, while I'm going to activate the question, that's the code uh, that you should enter there. Still, as I said, I need to activate the question. So it's 969-375. 969-375. So again here you have the number 969375. Is everyone on that website? Yeah? Okay. Uh, you will have two minutes time to answer this question, okay? Everyone ready? Then let's go. You have two minutes time. Maybe you can try to get the, uh, sure. yeah, for, from one of the other ones.
Are you awake? Okay, let's see how you have qualified those examples. Okay, here we have the percentage. So 63% are treaty on the European Union. Can any one of you tell us, depending on how you have decided, why yes or why no? For 63%, uh, the answer was yes, you would qualify that document as being law. And again, a disclaimer, we have not defined law so far, and I've not given you additional information. Yeah, so that's clearly law, yeah? And as you already pointed out, law at EU level. Uh, E-commerce act, and again, I am aware of the fact that I have not given you maybe enough information, <laughs> but that was on purpose. E-commerce act, 70%. Any idea why more classified this document to be law than the previous one? Is it because Maybe you assume that that's at national level. Or does the name act imply that it's a, a uh, legal document or should be qualified as law? It, yeah? I think it stabilizes like the main laws that have to rule the, the buying and selling through internet. So I think it's like, I guess, it's like an act that stabilizes the so you, you would argue that based on, on uh, your statement that it's uh, content-wise a very important document, e-commerce nowadays with online uh, trade, therefore it should be qualified as law. So you're rather referring to, to the content rather than to the, the type of document. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so more a content-related approach. Let's continue. Uh, the law on air pollution, that's a, uh, a lo local example. So whenever you have the chance on driving on the highway, you only have the chance of driving at 100 kilometers per hour at maximum, not 130. Why? Uh, that's uh, a regional law, so not a European one, not one which is made in Vienna, but one here, a local one from Tyrol, which again is the legal reason why you're only allowed to drive uh, 100 kilometers per hour at maximum. But I just assume that due to the fact that he had mentioned law on air pollution, that that's, that was the reason why a huge majority uh, opted for uh, qualifying it as law. A national provision, so here it's formulated in a more neutral way, uh, that allows euthanasia, only 53%. So the possibility of, uh, we talked about terminally ill uh, cancer patients, so the possibility of getting killed, a possibility that does not exist everywhere in the European Union, but for example in the Benelux countries and in Switzerland. And we still have to discuss if Switzerland is part of the European Union, if no, if they are in any other way linked to the European Union. So. Why only 53%? You don't have to give your personal reason uh, why. Maybe you decided that it's uh, not, that that should not be qualified as law, but maybe just any idea of uh, explanation why that was not qualified as being law, euthanasia, or a law uh, that allows or provides for the possibility of having euthanasia. You mean that the term allows? What does it indicate for you? Um, it just indicates like that it makes something legal, it doesn't really provide a barrier to you. Okay, so that it makes it legal, yeah. But still, it does not tell you you have to do euthanasia. Right. Yeah? Okay, but still the possibility means that it's allowed, that it's not illegal, and therefore you would qualify it as law. What about, uh, and here the wording, we still have a very sensitive issue, abortion, 
But here the wording is, uh, as you can see, different. Uh, and maybe that's the reason why instead of 53% euthanasia, only 30% uh, argued that the national provision that motivates women to have abortion uh, qualifies as law. Any comments on this? Again, it's just a, a guess from my side that it's the word motiv motiv to motivate. What does it mean, the term of nudging? I kind of push someone into something. Yeah, so that would be a law that by whatever means or tools pushes uh, women towards having abortion. Does that have any uh, influence on whether we qualify it as being law, yes or no? Who knows? <laughs> but just to point it out as a, uh, as a question and just to highlight and to allow, to motivate still two sensitive issues and as you can see the, the percentage uh, is way smaller compared to the other examples, especially to the one where it uh, is part of the title, Law on Air Pollution, uh, where we had 97%. EU Directive on Electronic Commerce. And that's interesting, here we have 70% and we also have 70% concerning the E-Commerce Act. Do you think there is any coincidence? E-Commerce Act, e -com EU E-Commerce Directive. What's the difference? Well, as I just mentioned before, the e-commerce directive has been issued at European level and still we're going to discuss under which preconditions. And, now, and then we have the e-commerce act which has been adopted by the Austrian parliament which is kind of the implementation of this e-commerce directive in Austria in order to further specify under which conditions uh, uh, e-commerce can happen. I already assumed that only uh, a low uh, ratio, in this case 33%, uh, percent, uh, mentioned that the possibility of sending state secretaries, not only ministers, to the Council of the EU, that we qualify that as law. Still, I'm going to mention it later on. Codes of conduct, what is it? Uh, why only 30% of your group that qualified those codes of conduct, those documents, as being law? What is it, a code of conduct? Yeah, and if I may link this statement to your previous statement, the correct way of doing something, for example, for medical doctors, what could be a code of conduct? Well, um, I think in medical case, like you've got a legal, a legal attachment to it, that if you don't follow <coughs> this code of conduct, you may get the trial. Yeah. And code of conduct, I don't know, like table manners, I see like that way, like the way of doing the things correctly. Yeah. But you're not in that legal way. So I think, yeah, what, what else? Like corruption. Like yeah. And in w which way do codes of conduct play a role in that regard? Within a hospital. No, but codes of conduct uh, and corruption, in which way? <coughs> okay. But then what is the difference to a criminal law, the Austrian criminal code? <laughs> which uh, also forbids corruption in any place, but also f uh, obviously in hospitals. Maybe the code of conduct are more kind of a moral obligation? Moral obligation, yeah. Obligation. More of a moral obligation than a legal obligation, but still uh, your point was that it, has, it might have some legal consequences, yeah? Yeah, how you should behave in a certain situation. But doesn't also uh, a law uh, on, on traffic, uh, uh, a, a legal provision on traffic law tell you how uh, fast you are allowed to go, whether you uh, should cross or stop if there is a red traffic light, where you are allowed to park your car. Isn't that kind of the same or isn't, that a, isn't there a, simil a similarity? So that you are but the form is the form different. Is different. Yeah. Yeah, but you would not go to jail uh, yeah. if <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you or I can promise you. 
But still, there are some similarities, yeah? Oh, it's connected to an institution or a company that published that? Okay, so, so as we had it here, treaty in the European Union, e EU directive applies on a normally for the whole European Union. We have uh, a national provision which might apply for all of Austria, similar as the E-Commerce Act applies everywhere in Austria. We have one example uh, which only applies for the Tyrol because it has been enacted by the Tyrolean uh, Parliament, the Landtag. Uh, and even more narrow, we might have a code of conduct which might only apply for one company. Yeah? So yes, that's a code of conduct and uh, as you pointed out before, codes of conduct normally we qualify as being soft law. So it's not hard law, so not law in, in this sense, which has been enacted by the European Union, by the Parliament in Vienna, by the regional par Parliament, but it's a document which can be drafted by anyone. So you don't need to be the legal authority, the Parliament, to enact this document, but still, and that's very important, that was your point, it still it can have some uh, legal consequences. And the reason why I also mentioned codes of conduct is that very often, for example, in more hardcore fields of European uh, economic law, like, for example, EU competition law, we find a lot of soft law. So it's not legally binding, but still, if you don't stick to those rules, you might run into some problems because then by not sticking to this soft law, certain actions might be deemed to be illegal. So it does not have a direct influence, but a kind of indirect influence. And there are a lot of examples where soft law play a very important role. That's why I referred also to, to the medical field. There we might have soft law. We have a lot of soft law in EU competition law. Um, also, for example, nowadays, as we're going to talk about the refugee situation, uh, the, there is a, we shouldn't call it agreement because technically speaking it's no agreement, but there is this statement, uh, EU Turkey, on the refugee situation. That's kind of soft law and there is one uh, on concerning Afghanistan, so EU Afghanistan. And also this document, legally speaking, has been qualified as soft law. We can discuss later on why the European Union has chosen this way and not to make hard law. Maybe you already have some ideas why they tried to evade hard law. Also here we have, and the percentage is almost the same, 30, 33 ethical principles for medical research involving human subjects. So here we have soft law in the field, in the medical field. And then all of you who signed a contract with MCI also had to agree to MCI's general terms and conditions of business. And what we can find over there, MCI's house rules. Uh, today, those two examples qualify as law. So only 23% for the house rules. 33 for the general terms and conditions. Law? Yes or no? I think the, the general terms and conditions, you have to sign them. Yeah. So it makes it like a legal paper. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the MCI has rules. Maybe if you, if you attend to classes, you have to follow those rules. But not as a legal aspect. Yeah. But the same thing, soft rules. And yeah. So also here the question is in which way they are legally binding. Uh, but Unlike the, the examples rather on the top of that list, um, law cannot only be enacted by a authority for the whole country or for the whole European Union, but of course we can also make a law if I, if you uh, decide to sell me your smartphone, we would have a contract between uh, which only binds the two of us and uh, obviously also this contract could be qualified as law depending on whether we take a rather broad notion of law or whether we narrow it down. Similar as like hard law, soft law, and also this uh, regional component for whom does law apply. So, just to supplement this information, as you can see, uh, I've added, so we, we can qualify all those documents as law, so that's the solution, if you wish. <coughs> But in addition, uh, I always indicated who is the legal authority which has enacted uh, those documents. So, as it was already mentioned, the Treaty on the European Union, that's a very important legal document enacted by the member states. The E-Commerce Act, that's enacted by the Austrian Parliament, which implements 
this directive, and we will see later on that what we call EU secondary law is enacted by uh, the European Parliament and by the Council of Ministers or the Council of the EU. That's a, if here we have a, a national or a federal <coughs> law, here we have a regional one. <coughs> Those two examples about uh, allowing uh, euthanasia, motivating for abortion, uh, those are invented examples, uh, so they might qualify as law. But what I wanted to point out with those examples is uh, maybe someone deems them to be unmoral. That depends on your personal attitude. And we come back to the definition, not only now of law, but also later on of morality, uh, maybe in the afternoon. I don't know uh, if any one of you is into ski touring, so hiking up the mountain with his keys. And there have uh, recently been some complaints that uh, the, the, the ski resorts normally prepare the slopes uh, during the season, that now they destroyed the slopes for whatever reason, because maybe they want the snow to melt uh, quicker or they don't, uh, they don't want to risk uh, run into any uh, type of uh, legal liabilities, so who knows. But still, uh, even during the winter season, there is often the question if uh, people are allowed to take their skis and hike up the hill. So first of all, they are not paying for, uh, for a lift ticket. And the question is basically, if they do it, for example, in the evening, they would destroy the slopes. Because then uh, the snow, if it's more softer during the day, it gets harder during the night. And if, you have, if they have prepared the slopes, if you carve down, then you might cut in some holes. And maybe on the next day, someone who has bought a lift ticket has an accident because uh, you kind of destroyed uh, the slope. And then you already see the strong motivation why ski resorts want to prohibit people from hiking up the mountain. That's one very strong argument on the one side. On the other side, uh, people argue, for example, here in Tyrol, that people have always hiked up the mountain, so that they should have a right to do so. So that's what we call customary law. So it's not that law, like in the other examples, is enacted by whatever authority and is applied top down. But here the question is, and uh, there is some uncertainty because it's not written down like the other examples. So first of all, it's not written down. And second, it's not enacted top down, but Im it emerges bottom up. Because if a broad majority of the population argues that they have always done it, bless you. So you have this uh, element of repetition plus uh, the opinio juris, as it's called, plus the opinion that it's legal to, to walk up the mountains, then that's what we call customary law. So it's those two components. First of all, it's not written. That's one characteristic. It's not top down, but it's bottom up. And the two elements that we need uh, to have customary law is that there is a constant repetition of doing it over years without clearly defining how many years. And it's, for example, if you always steal uh, flowers from your neighbor's garden, you can never argue that you thought that it's legal. Walking up the mountains, uh, you can argue that you deem it to be legal. So that's what we call customary law. And that example was just uh, to highlight that also at European level, we do have customary law. So if we have this one institution, which we're going to see later on, the Council of Ministers, where, as the name already indicates, it's the ministers of each country who decide on EU law. Uh, here we have customary law, the possibility, because they've always done it, they have deemed it to be legal, that also state secretaries, so which is like one level below the minister, so that they can also go, go to the Council of Ministers and take a decision for their country. I also mentioned soft law. Here one other example of soft law. And here the also would be MCI. Again, here for the last two examples, we are not in the situation of an authority in acting law, so top down. But we have two parties, the student and MCI, signing a contract. Similar as like if you buy a laptop, if you buy a piece of bread, uh, where also this contract might be qualified as law. So 
after we have se seen several examples highlighting different uh, possibilities of di different types of examples, let's now turn to the definition of law. And that's just one definition. So similar as I mentioned that the book on the ethics of, Im of immigration, it's not the one and only way how of defining ethics of immigration. Also here we have one, but still one very important definition. And it goes as follows. <coughs> Let the term law refer to positive law as opposed to natural law. And we have still not defined of what would be natural law. We talked about religion. So positive law, which has been, been enacted by humans, not by God. That is existing systems of social rules. So it's always about finding rules of people, how they are allowed to interact. That require, and in many cases, enforce compliance and punish non-compliance. Uh, our example, the netiquette of how to behave in Adobe Connect, uh, you would not be punished, just that uh, you, it might be deemed uh, unpolite if you talk while someone else is talking, or that you might run into some technical uh, issues if, uh, if you don't comply with those rules. What is important, and I think that was the case for all of those examples, that here we have rules for uh, human behavior. How would you qualify the situation if, uh, I don't know, the sheep of your neighbor come to your garden and destroy your flowers? Can you punish the sheep or the cows or whatever animal is causing the damage? Can you punish the animal? You say, no, I condemn you to barbecue. <laughs> Would that be possible? <coughs> Sorry? So, don't see why not. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be again the, the argument of the, the hungry lions that we had earlier. <laughs> no, obviously not because uh, law only addresses, it's made by and it only addresses human beings. Of course it can also have implications that you can, you can uh, sell the cow, you can buy the cow or the sheep, whatever. So that's what, what your point, it's, it's not a human being, it's a thing, it can be traded unlike human beings, and I pointed out that in Roman times also slaves were not treated as human beings, but nowadays that would be possible, but clearly here the law only addresses uh, human beings, meaning your neighbor has to make sure that his sheep, that he has a, has a fence or whatever, so that uh, his sheep cannot destroy your garden or the flowers in your garden. Law should not only be a theoretical solution, but it should also have some practical Im implications. So that's why law always implies that it can be enforced. So it's not only, it should not only be written in books or nowadays in, in databases, but there should also be mechanisms of how to enforce the law. How is the law enforced? How is law enforced? How do you enforce law? So there are some like, negative consequences if you... Like negative consequences, like for instance? People are put to jail. People are put to jail, uh, or if you don't pay, if, for example, I uh, buy your smartphone, but if I, if I take it, if I receive it, but I refuse to pay, because I promised to pay, or we agreed to, that I pay tomorrow, but I never paid, what can happen? How can then how can that be enforced? And you have to go to court again. She would have to go to court to sue me, and once she has a judgment uh, uh, which cannot be appealed, what happens then? Because the judgment again can be seen as a piece of paper, and sh she can uh, put it somewhere. But how to make sure that she receives I don't know the one hundred euro? that we agreed uh, that I would pay in return for her smartphone. Can I just go and, and uh, grab her wallet? Or can she grab my wallet and, and take 100 euros? It's just over there. <laughs> Who? State. Exactly, so the state uh, would make sure that in any way deducting it from my wage here at MCI or 
taking my uh, computer, whatever, they could in enforce it so that in the end she would receive the money. But depending on what type of law we're talking, obviously, and we also already talked about criminal law, there are very different ways of enforcing law. What is here called the rule of rec recognition, that basically means that in law, very often we have different layers, a uh, hierarchy, and we'll come back to that on one of the next slides. And on that, or norm always, the, the highest layer of law defines of how laws are enacted in a different uh, legal system. How? What's, how do we call this higher layer of law? If you take a hierarchy of law, how do we normally call the, the highest level? Exactly, so we have uh, with a constitution, and that constitution defines of how law is enacted. What, uh, what would uh, the constitution normally provide of how law is enacted? Yeah, so there would be a separation of power. We come both to, we talk about hierarchy and about separation of powers uh, right in a moment. So on every, uh, normally uh, in a dem democratic system, uh, the constitution would provide that there is a parliament which votes, uh, there have to be certain majorities, and uh, then the output, uh, if it fulfills all those requirements, would be qualified as law. Why have you been laughing? <laughs> Sorry? Just because you said in a democratic yeah, setting. Yeah, and if it's not a democratic <laughs> setting, then, <laughs> then in, if you have dictatorship, so if you would be the dictator, then you, we would not have to vote on, if we are the parliament in, in, in dictatorship, we would just be kind of actors, if, if you wish. Uh, you would decide anyway, no matter how parliament would decide, if at all there is a parliament. Sure. I was just thinking about the elections. Uh, yeah. Last but not least, remember my example of uh, throwing Christians uh, to the lions in Asian, ancient Roman times? Um, or think about, and maybe there, w I don't know, maybe uh, there was a law which explicitly stated that Christians can be thrown to the lions. And we don't have to go back in history as far. Think about uh, the Nazi regime, where you had laws which were passed by parliament fulfilling all the requirements of the constitution at the time. Let's assume that. But there were laws which stated that uh, Jewish people uh, would be sent to concentration camps and killed. Would you qualify those provisions as law? Well, if we have a very formalistic approach, then uh, we said yes, if all the requirements are fulfilled, there were the, the competent institutions were involved in the decision-making process and all the, the majorities, all the formalities have been met. Yes, then whatever we have at the end, the document, we would qualify it as law irrespective of the content. And obviously, I think we all agree that such a law would be uh, strongly uh, unmoral. Uh, but the question is, do we rather take a formalistic approach how the document has been set up or are we rather f focusing on, uh, on the content? Similar as uh, your argument before was e-commerce act. E-commerce is a very important issue nowadays. Therefore, based on the content, not so much on the name, act or bill or however we want to call it, uh, we would qualify it as law. But that's just to show you the link between law and also morality, that it might be the case that we have law which is or a document which we would qualify as law due to formal reasons, but content-wise, uh, we would all agree that it's strongly unjust or strongly immoral. Who can make law? Parliament. So, we have some colleagues from France, so very famous philosopher uh, from your country. What can you tell us about him? That he's French? <laughs> yes. <laughs> So you can confirm that. So he's French and uh, it's very important if you hear about such concepts 
that you also know uh, about the, the, the background situation why certain theories have been developed. So here uh, the, the legal system, which just talked about democracy, <coughs> well, we wouldn't call it uh, as dictatorship, but it was kind of similar because it was absolutism. So we had one person, the king or, or the queen, uh, who had absolute power and in order to limit that power and in order to keep him from taking arbitrary decisions and also now from the perspective of citizens to guarantee uh, freedom uh, he invented this system uh, which basically is quite easy just by separating different functions you increase the liberty the freedom of people and you limit the power of the king so can you explain me those three powers And again, as I said, it's very important uh, that we now set those common bases because we, when then, for example, discussing surrogacy, one important issue will be uh, which of those three stakeholders uh, or powers has created certain rules at EU level, for instance. And that will be a major issue, not only discussing the content, but also the question who has shaped uh, the rules on, for example, surrogacy. Uh, and therefore it's very important to clearly point out what are the different functions of those three powers. Can anyone start with any of the three branches of power? Uh, legislator uh, is uh, creating the law and so the parliament votes vote for it and make them to apply in all countries or above. Uh, the judiciary is uh, enforcing them uh, in the court, like uh, making sure that they are applied and well applied, and executive in, is enforcing them to the citizens, I think. Yeah. So, as you point, clearly pointed out, yes, it's the legislator, the parliament in a democracy uh, which uh, drafts the law. That should be a democratic process. So, you vote for the members of parliament. Then you have certain political parties and the majority decides on the laws. <coughs> we already had the function of uh, the, the issue, the notion of executing laws. So that's the ju uh, judiciary in a sense that whenever there is a dispute, could be between different stakeholders. So me against you because, or you against me if I don't pay for the smartphone where I ought to pay uh, 100 euros. Could be also be that um, for instance, one region in Austria is suing another region or even the federal go uh, government uh, because they uh, deem that there is a breach of the constitution. So they are enforcing the, the, the law in certain disputes and they also decide what, how to interpret the law. But, and that's very important, uh, normally they should not create new law because that's the function of parliament. And just this relationship is one uh, which we're going to need not only but also for the topic of uh, surrogacy. Um, the question to which extent, for example, if there is a gap, if there is no law on a certain issue because it's a new issue like uh, reproductive uh, technologies or for example self-driving cars, if we assume that for the moment being there, uh, there, there is no law because it's a new emerging topic, the question to which extent those gaps can be filled by the courts. That's one very uh, uh, important issue. And just to give you the attitude of Montesquieu on that issue, he mentioned uh, the courts are only la bouche qui prononce la parole de la loi. So only the mouse that repeats the words or whatever has been decided by parliament. So rather a very, let's say, technical uh, approach, so kind of a computer, you, in, you fill it with all the information and then the output is uh, the judgment, but the law should not, or the, the judges should not, not create new law because clearly that is uh, the role of parliament. Like wi wi which example were? Well, I can remember. I'm originally from Turkey. Yeah. In the past, there were there were also some suggestions for new law, like from also from the current president, and then the courts were against 
Yeah. So ob obviously, if, uh, qu there can be different types of quotes. So for my example, where you buy a, s uh, a smartphone, you don't pay for it. Those, w those would be quotes of private law. Uh, if whenever I talk about constitutional disputes, we would have a uh, constitutional court which deals with those kind of issues. And that, for example, would be the question if Parliament has breached the Constitution. So, for example, if Austria would introduce, if the Austrian Parliament would introduce a law um, allowing for death penalty, and we had that for our uh, for the trolley car example, if the, or for the second one, uh, the the kidnapped aircraft, if there would be a law, and there was actually a law in Germany, so there was the situation after 9/11, so taking the experience of 9/11, and you know that one aircraft. Uh, was directed into the, the Pentagon, yeah. Um, having seen that example, the German parliament said, okay, now we're going to enact a law which allows the government, the military, or the government based on information of the military, to take the decision to shoot down an aircraft for exactly the situation that I described. It was then the German constitutional court, so the highest court uh, in of Germany in Karlsruhe, which decided, no, this law that allows a pilot, based on orders from the ground, to shoot down the kidnapped aircraft, that is against the German constitution. We will see later on why that decision has been taken, on which grounds, on which arguments, but that is just one example. And there could be a lot of other examples where especially constitutional courts decide on disputes between different, let's call them, public stakeholders in a country. How would you describe the relationship of the legislative and the executive branch of power? Who checks whom? They implement it. Yeah. yeah. So, so executive power just make them like enforce the people to, to follow those rules. Yeah. So that's a very common pattern that obviously here we have the stakeholder who makes the laws, parliament, but then all the details which are added and all the enforcement. So, so for example, if there is a tax law, that's parliament which enacts uh, who should pay uh, how many taxes. Uh, but it's then uh, the tax authorities, the executive power, which tells you, well, okay, that's your income. Uh, uh, those uh, are the payments that you had to make. And based on the rules enacted by parliament, whoop, in the end, that's X amount of euros that you have to pay in terms of income tax or whatever. So that's the executive. In which way are they linked to each other, the legislative power and the executive power? Is there anything which an underlying common feature, if I may put it this way, which links the, the executive power and the, the legislative power. They are elected. Who is elected? Uh, both in the parliament. Do, do you normally elect both of them? <coughs> it, it's kind of... Exactly, normally, but it depends on, on your uh, the country where you're coming from. You elect the parliament, but, and I think that was your point, based on the majorities in the parliament, uh, they would set up a government. And so what we could, or what I called uh, the common, uh, the, the similarity would be uh, the, the political parties, because you vote for political parties in the parliament, but then the, the, the one or the, the two uh, parties that have a majority in the parliament, they would set up the government. And so very often, previously, the idea so that would have been the king, which is controlled by parliament. And that idea nowadays does not exist uh, in proper terms, because the political parties, they kind of combine those two powers, which according to Montesquieu should rather be separated. So that's the uh, separation of powers. What you already had is the hierarchy uh, of law. And as you already pointed out, we have the, uh, 
the, uh, the highest level uh, of law, which is the constitution. I would just suggest, uh, as now that's a lot of information, that now we make a short break uh, of five minutes, short uh, time to, to get a coffee, whatever, and then let's continue uh, with this hierarchy of law, and then in the next step we're going to move, uh, or we're going to apply all that knowledge to the European level, okay? That's a very short break of five minutes, and then we'll continue here. So before our short break, we finished with the, the hierarchy of law. Can any one of you explain it to me? What does it mean, the hierarchy of law? What are the takeaways from this slide? Well, the higher the law is, the higher the priority. So whenever there's a law in a like, lower stadium, then Exactly, and there are basically two uh, perspectives. One is, for example, if we take ordinary legislation, that the one example would be the E-Commerce Act. Uh, the Austrian E-Commerce Act may not contradict the Constitution. So if there is a conflict, if the one says the situation is black, the other one says, it, no, it's white, <coughs> bless you, then uh, the we have the, the priority or the supremacy of the higher layer of law, so if there is a, a, a conflict. On the other hand, and that's what you have seen uh, before, talking about <coughs> uh, what was it? Here, the rule of recognition. So that basically means that uh, in constitutional law, we find all the prerequisites, for example, the majorities that, it, that are needed, in order to enact new or to change existing law. So it's the higher level defines how provisions can be enacted at the lower level. That's the one perspective. The other perspective is if there is a contradiction between the, 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 the higher level and the lower, and that's, that's fairly easy, it's the higher layer of law that prevails over the lower la layer of law. Now, having defined the relationship between different layers in general, let's now go through uh, the, the list from top. What you can see here, or this judgment of the Court of Justice of, of Luxembourg, of the European Union, uh, was given in a German case called Internationale Handelsgesellschaft in the early 1970s. In this judgment, it has been defined that EU law has supremacy over all of national law. So we can really place it on top. I have to uh, admit, I have to uh, make clear that there are some scholars who would place EU law not here on top, but rather here between those two layers of constitutional law, which I still need to uh, explain. But just so you know, my approach, as it was stated here in this judgment, is that EU law is above all of national law. That's also a rule of some that, it's, that you can very easily uh, remember. Now, what are those two layers, which, for example, we have in Austria, uh, of constitutional law, where one is called the constitution, the other one is called uh, the structural principles. Does any one of you know what are the core principles, the structural principles of the Austrian constitution? Have a guess? That we are democracy, yes, that's one of the uh, structural principles. The rule of law, yeah, what else? What we have seen on the earlier slide, separation of powers, is also one of the core principles of, Aust of, uh, of Austrian constitutional law. Yeah, that's the, the principle of democracy, yeah, also very important. Uh, also, for example, the fact that we are a federal country, I already pointed out to the three layers, so we have the federal level in Vienna, we have the regional level here in, uh, in, in Tyrol, and we have the level of the municipality, so that's what uh, people here in Innsbruck are going to elect uh, next <coughs> Sunday. Uh, so that's not the federal level in Vienna, that's not the regional level of Tyrol, but here for the city of Innsbruck, so the, the le level of the municipalities where we are going to have elections uh, on Sundays. So 
this federal principle, apart from the democratic principle, uh, also the, the liberal principle that, that was also was mentioned here, guaranteeing freedom, yes, that's done by the separation of powers, but that's also done by safeguarding human rights. If there is a parliament, it cannot not enact any new law, but every new law, and every existing law, has to respect the human rights of, for example, Austrian people. So if there is a new law, I don't know, in the field of data, data protection, which infringes your rights in terms of data protection or your right to life, that was our example with the trolley car, we cannot enact death penalty because both here at this and at this level, and also at this level, we have a clear no to death penalty and therefore if the Austrian parliament would enact such a law, it would be declared to be unconstitutional by the Austrian Constitutional Court. So here we have the core principles and both of them qualify as constitutional law in Austria, but the higher layer obviously contains the key principle and everything else which is also constitutional law uh, would be in this layer. And then one layer below we have what we call ordinary national law, so for example the e-commerce act or the Austrian uh, criminal code, uh, the Austrian uh, code on traffic law which, which I took as an example earlier, so all those provisions of law would fall into this category. Now why do we need to distinguish these different layers of law? What is one very important difference if we compare those three layers of law? If I want to change anything into here, I don't know uh, who has ambitions of becoming the king or the queen of Austria, which currently is not pos possible because we are a republic, mm. so there is no king, no queen. If any one of you has the ambition to become queen or king of Austria, what has to, how can we change this layer of law? By a yeah. So we don't only need a certain majority in parliament, so that's what we will discuss with regard to here, but in addition we need a referendum to make you, for example, being uh, the Queen of Austria. Okay, so we need a referendum. Parliament itself cannot take that decision, but that's a decision which can only be taken by the people themselves, the citizens, uh, in a referendum. So if we know that here we need a referendum, what do we need here? Who is in charge of changing constitutional law if it's not the core principles? And uh, what has to happen so that uh, any provision of the Austrian constitutional law can be changed? Voting in Parliament, Voting in Parliament and there. They might be involved uh, in advance, uh, for example in France and in Austria there are uh, different uh, approaches uh, of assessing the law before it comes into force, only afterwards, so the, if you compare France and Austria there are two different approaches. But which majority do we need in Parliament to pass constitutional law? Exactly, so we need a two-thirds majority, whereas, and now we're coming to, to this layer of law, uh, ordinary legislation, what majority do we need in Parliament to pass an amendment, for example, to the E-Commerce Act? Simple majority, so 50% plus one. So referendum, two-thirds majority in Parliament, referendum again means you need to involve the citizens. Here it's only Parliament, two-thirds majority, simple majority. And then if we take this distinction of parliament, which I now mentioned, and the executive power. So here it's parliament, two-thirds simple majority. Here administrative regulations, for, for instance, which add additional details to uh, the principles that have been enacted by parliament. Here that would be done by the executive. For example, if we have a law in Austria on uh, students affairs, that has been passed by Parliament and for example if MCI can grant a certain amount of money to the best students each year, 
It's uh, a regulation of the Austrian Ministry of Education, which decides for every year how much money, for example, MCI, and how much money each department gi can give to the best uh, students, following certain principles which are defined here, which can be further clarified here by the executive power by the ministry. But the principles are enacted by parliament. And we have this principle of legality, meaning that both the courts and the executive power, they are both bound by the provisions as they have been enacted by parliament. Why? Because that's the only institution which is democratically elected by the citizens. That's why they have the power to make rules for the citizens. Here it's only indirectly. Uh, in Austria, in Europe, you don't elect judges. We have that in the United States. I cannot tell you by heart for which courts you can elect judges. Yeah. yeah? <laughs> uh, um, sorry, I don't understand your question. So, as I said, That if we take the principle of democracy, you can vote for the members of parliament. Indirectly, the, uh, by voting for the members of parliament, you can also decide who runs uh, the, uh, the government, the ministries. But I said, normally, uh, there is no election of judges. But sometimes there might be syst systems where you also at least can uh, elect some of the judges. Then, just talking about judges, we have judgments of courts and also administrative decisions. And if you remember the definition of law, in the end, it should also be enforced. Otherwise, it's a very a purely uh, theoretical issue. If it cannot be enforced, then also it would not be uh, uh, respected by the citizens or by the companies if uh, there is no enforcement of the law. Remember, that was one of the characteristics of this definition. Again, that's not the only definition of law. And we can take a more broader uh, definition, uh, also including, for example, soft law. We can narrow it down. We have now seen the different authorities that can pass law, also in our examples. So, but still, uh, we take here a rather broad definition. Therefore, all of the examples from the survey, uh, the PINGO survey, would qualify as law. Now, if we, that was the general introduction, if we now apply that to the European Union, so like we also discussed the relationship of law and ethics, but also of EU law and ethics, so also here now having defined the broad characteristics of law, now applying that to the European Union, uh, in which way does this slide correspond to the previous slide? So the, the hierarchy of law as such, but also uh, here now, the hierarchy of EU law. In which way is it similar? In which way is it different? What do they say? What do you say? Also, in EU law, we have a hierarchy of the sources. Yeah. Uh, what would you qualify as constitutional law on this slide? Primary law. Yeah. So there we find the most important principles in EU primary law. That's what it's not officially termed uh, 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 constitutional law, but it has kind of a similar function if we simplify it. And what is called EU secondary law? It's like, uh, I don't know, what's the name of the ordinary law? So, so that's would, that's EU primary, that would be or equal EU primary law, that would equal EU secondary law, okay? <coughs> the question who enacts those documents, we said it's a two thirds majority or it's even a referendum. Here it's different because uh, here for EU primary law, we have the 28 member states who enact those provisions. So if we need to change EU primary law, we always need a consensus amongst all 28 member states to make any amendment uh, to those provisions. Why? So if, if you, it's it's a very, uh, you could say it's a very minor detail of European Union law. Still, it's a key characteristic because, for example, if we take uh, the financial crisis and the way how the European Union, if we take it as such, reacted to the financial crisis, and if I pointed out the different perspectives, let's just assume there is a room and we have some economists, experts 
for, for, for economic issues, they made suggestions how to tackle a financial crisis, how to regulate banks, whatever it takes. Maybe we have a lot of good proposals on the table, but then came the lawyers, now in the very, let's say, negative roles, and the lawyers always told uh, the experts, or then the politicians, if the both uh, the economic experts and the lawyers advised the politicians, the lawyers then uh, told everyone in the room, well, might really be a good idea, but we need to change pr EU primary law in order to implement that idea, which means all 28 member states have to agree. What does it mean that all 28 member states have to agree? So again, if we jump back two slides to the separation of powers, who has to agree in Austria so that in the end we can say Austria has agreed? Parliament? Maybe also, oh, uh, we should rather start this way, government for sure, maybe also parliament and depending on the hierarchy of law, maybe even the citizens. So always the, uh, the government, the representative uh, then in Brussels, the Austrian representative. It might be that it's an issue where also parliament has to be involved. It might even be the case that you have to make a referendum, and that very much de or that depends on the relevant constitution. Uh, in Austria, when do you have to involve uh, the, the citizens in a referendum? If what we have heard on, on, on the previous slide, well, if you change the core principles, if you would say, okay, we change the democratic principle in a in, in the one way or the other then we would uh, need to involve the Austrian citizens. If we only need to change the constitution, well, then uh, it's parliament and government. So, and I can tell you, for example, in Ireland, if you just change one word in the EU treaties, you have to ask, the you have to make a referendum uh, to involve the Irish voters and therefore the politicians, when tackling the financial crisis or any other challenge, they always knew that that not a possibility at the moment because the the risk to fail is too high because you need a unanimous decision in all 28 member states if only uh, the voters in Ireland are against it or there's no one this year from Canada but uh, you know CETA the free trade agreement with Canada EU Canada who was against it? Like not all of Belgium, which is one out of 28, but one part of Belgium due to their constitution, uh, constitutional sit situation was against it, which means you, can, uh, it's, uh, you cannot take a unanimous decision. So just to show you uh, the challenge of changing what we could call uh, constitutional law at EU level. Now, if we go one step, ba step backwards, uh, what is what do we qualify as EU constitutional law? It's the one example that you have seen earlier, the Treaty on the European Union, the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, where, for example, we find the fundamental freedoms, talking about the single European market, what I mentioned earlier, all the amendments to those treaties and, very important, now that's the legal document which does not allow us to introduce death penalty, not in general, also not with regard to the trolley car example, because that's the EU's key document on human rights, the Charter of Fundamental Rights in the European Union, which in Article 2 uh, guarantees the right to life, which also means that you cannot introduce death penalty. That's, for example, because you mentioned... Uh, some ideas uh, in, in Turkey. Turkey is a candidate country, but of course that also applies for a current member state like Austria. If any country that is or wants to become a member of the European Union introduces death penalty, that's a no-go and you're absolutely out. That's like if you write a, a master thesis or a bachelor thesis, if it contains plagiarism, you're not in a second step in terms of uh, assessing the quality of that paper, but it's absolutely no-go and you automatically failed. That's the very same situation here. 
if uh, a country introduces the death penalty, all the other prerequisites are not, do not count anymore, but that's a kind of a, a knockout criteria. So that's EU primary law. What is EU secondary law? Well, that's a whole range of legal provisions which try to create this, uh, not only, but especially the single European market. We have provisions on e-commerce. What, what other provisions of EU law do we have? A very famous one which enters into force next month in May. I'm sure you have heard about it. You mentioned it before. Data protection, the general data protection regulation where we had a directive before. Now we have a regulation and you can already see that there are some legal differences between regulations and uh, directives. What are the examples of EU law that you know? Sometimes also some very strange ones. Roaming, yeah, roaming regulation. It's, all, it's like data protection, it's a regulation. So it guarantees you that uh, you don't have to pay more than certain thresholds if you have roamed uh, voice calls. We will talk about this uh, example in one of our online courses. What else? Agriculture, Agriculture yeah, very important issue. The global, Sir? The global yeah, environmental yeah. protection. What else? Infrastructure, yeah, there are a lot of rules. Air passenger rights, for example, a lot of consumer protection. I just <coughs> benefited from this uh, regulation on air passenger rights uh, last fall when my flight from Innsbruck to Brussels via Vienna was delayed. And uh, so I wrote the, the airline, I want, I want to claim that amount of euros of compensation, depending on the reason and the distance. You're simply ignored by the airline. So you don't even get a response, not even a negative response, you're just ignored. And then uh, it's not only that, for example, this regulation grants you a certain right to get a compensation. It even provides for an agency for Austria located in Vienna, which then would contact uh, the, the airline. And in just two days after I uh, filled out the online complaint form, I got a, an, uh, a letter by the agency, not by the airline, telling me, yes, you are entitled to this 250 euros of compensation. So therefore, we, that leads us to the definition of a regulation. That's a legal document which can be automatically applied, in this case, for example, between me as a consumer and the airline <coughs> as a company, which grants me certain rights, which is binding in Austria, although it has not been enacted by the Austrian parliament, so it creates rights which have the same legal value <coughs> as Austrian national law, but they are, those provisions are enacted in Brussels, not in Vienna. But the legal effects are absolutely the same. The they, are <coughs> they can be found here. So the freedom of services, the freedom of uh, free movement of products, of workers, uh, freedom of establishment, freedom of capital, so investing, or freedom of payments, that can all be found here. <coughs> Examples for directives, we have seen already one, the e-commerce directive, very important nowadays. That's a legal document which is drafted at European level, as we know, or as I mentioned earlier, by European Parliament and by Council of Ministers, <coughs> but it needs to be implemented into national law. That means we do need, or Austrian Parliament has to enact a document, which, as you know, is called the E-Commerce Act, which implements the, the principles of this directive and makes them enforceable in Austria. So a directive is not directly enforceable, like a regulation, but in case of a directive, you don't only search for the regulation, search for the directive, and you need to make sure in which way it is implemented uh, in Austria. And therefore, there can be some differences. It could be that, for example, a consumer protection directive, which grants you a right to cancel a contract, depending on the system, provides for a similar deadline all over Europe. Or it could be that there is a different deadline, I don't know, seven days in Italy, 14 days in Austria, so that depends on uh, the type of directive. For example, talking about this example of consumer protection, previously uh, 
this directive on consumer rights, or those directives, they rather followed the approach of minimum harmonization, which means at least seven days of, of the right of cancel a contract in every country, can be more, but at least seven days. Uh, just imagine if you're running an online shop, what's the better solution for you as a company if, it's, if it can be different in each country or if it's one deadline for all countries? Obviously, one deadline for all countries because then it's just easier to be implemented. That's what we call full harmonization. When, when nowadays, and you all know that from ordering uh, products, whatever, on, on, on the internet, nowadays it's 14 days. If you, anything that you order online, you have a, a right of cancelling the contract without uh, having to state the reason. Just, it's a free decision. The, the product may be top quality might be exactly the product that you want, but just because you ordered it online, you have the right to cancel that contract within 14 days. And that's the same deadline all over Europe. So here we have not the EU institutions, but the member states, all 28, so that's very important. Here, for secondary law, we have uh, the following situation. We have also as we have now know from the previous slides, we need uh, a parliament in a democracy <coughs> to enact uh, law. In this case, uh, there are two chambers of parliament. One is actually called the European Parliament. The second chamber that also has decided on that issue is not called parliament, it's the Council of Ministers. So here we have 751 members of the European Parliament currently. Here we have uh, a table for 28 ministers. So if they discuss agricultural affairs, what you mentioned, it's agricultural ministers. Education, it's educational ministers and so on. And they are acting based on a proposal of the European Commission. So that's how decisions are made in, uh, in the European Union. So again, the data protection regulation. <coughs> there was a proposal of the European Commission and uh, Vivian Reding, who gave a guest speech at MCI last week, former Vice President of the European Commission, she was one of the key drivers for this general data protection regulation, but it's not for the European Commission to decide it, they just propose it, and then the European Parliament, so a majority <coughs> of those 751 members of Parliament, representing the interests of the citizens, plus the ministers, representing national interests, they have to then uh, formally adopt that law. Let's make a very short case study. Let's assume uh, there is a proposal on the table of the European Commission uh, making stronger requirements for environmental protection. For example, reducing uh, CO2, CO2 emission of cars, for example. Have a guess, how, what do you think, how would the European uh, Parliament vote? Would they rather be in favour or rather against? In favour? Why in favour? <laughs> Just a guess. Because represent the interests of the citizen. Exactly, they represent the interests of the citizen and I think we can all agree that one key interest of uh, EU citizens would be to have the possibility to breathe uh, air which is not polluted uh, and therefore, the European Parliament uh, most likely would vote in favour. What about the Council of Ministers? It depends which ministers. Are Let's take the German minister. Yeah, but if, if, if it's the agriculture minister, yeah. the environment. Well, first of all, it depends on, on Germany, whom they are going to send uh, to Brussels for this decision. and taking the decision of rather sending the uh, Minister for Economic Affairs or the Minister for Environmental Issues, although they would define uh, which ministers should meet, but still in the end it's up to Germany whom they're going to send. Let's, let's, if it's the Minister for Economic Affairs, how do you think how would he or she decide in that voting? Maybe not vote in favor, 
Exactly. So here, uh, and we can see that pattern that very often, uh, <coughs> also if we take other issues of environmental protection, very often we see that the member states, and also our guest speaker last week confirmed that, that very often member states, uh, you could also say, well, as you know, people in one country voted for the parliament in that country, and that parliament, or out of that parliament, we have the government. So indirectly, also the, the, the government should represent the interests of the citizens, just that we know that nowadays, very often they rather uh, represent uh, the opinion of the industries, uh, because there's a lot of lobbying, uh, so theoretically they should rather uh, promote the interests of citizens, but very often we can see that it's rather the interests uh, of lobbyists which are represented here. So let's take uh, this slide uh, to finish and in, in to some way uh, to wrap it up. So what you can see here, that's the process uh, of decision making. Now, not at the national level, but at the European level. And again, there are some similarities if you compare it. Obviously, there are also some uh, differences. And to start with the second part on this slide, as I mentioned, we always need a proposal of the European Commission. That's the one institution that represents the interests of the whole European Union, the whole organization. Uh, if there is no proposal of the Commission, the other institutions cannot uh, continue with their work. So we always need first a proposal of the European Commission, and then, as we have already seen on the previous slide, those two chambers, where only the one is called European Parliament, and the second chamber of this Parliament is called the Council of Ministers, they then ha together have to decide, and only if those the two of them agree, then we have an EU directive or an EU regulation <laughs> as you know, with different legal effects. We then might have, in case of directives, the necessity to implement those, this agreement at the European level, this directive, into national law. The e-commerce directive has to be implemented via the e-commerce act. That can be one law, that can be several laws, that's up to each member state. Last but not least, and here, again, if we take the separation of powers, we need to bring in the courts, in this case <coughs> the national courts, but especially also the, Euro uh, the, the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg, which then makes sure that the member states, but also uh, the companies, uh, for example in case of EU competition law, that they correctly apply and don't breach those pr uh, provisions of EU law. So therefore, and I have to state at this stage, and that's why I emphasized the difference of the three branches of power in terms of uh, the European Union, especially if there are certain fields where we don't have EU laws, so we have a gap, so to say, then very often we have judgments of, uh, in this case, of the Court of Justice, which fills those gaps, and then again we have the question if, as Montesquieu mentioned it, if the judge should only be uh, the world uh, so the mouth that pronounces uh, the, 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 the rule of the law, or whether the courts are more active and fill those gaps. But so he can really say, last but not least, and the courts at EU level, they play a very important role for the system of European Union law. Isn't it also critical if uh, the parliament, with its majority, sends the expo, or represents also the kind of the executive um, part? Normally, within the parliament, everyone should vote for themselves, right? And within parties, they normally just yeah. vote yeah. because someone raised the hand. Yeah. And then do it all together. So, what you had, so I addressed when talking about the separation of powers two issues. One, that in previous time we had the parliament and, and the king, uh, where the parliament was installed to uh, limit the power of the king. The king could be seen as the executive. So here there was a natural uh, conflict, which in a positive sense, which helped to uh, limit the powers in that system. Also from the United States we have this notion of checks and balances. So you could say, well, they all uh, block each other in a negative sense, but in a positive sense you could say, well, that's a system which guarantees that no one gets too powerful in a sense that, uh, that the power would be uh, abused. So that's this idea that, that uh, which nowadays does not always properly function because the political parties, 
they kind of overlap the parliament and government. So there is no, in a positive sense, no conflict between those two because it's just the political parties that decide. So that's the relationship of parliament to government. Now if you only look at parliament, that, I think that, that was your point, uh, it's not each member of parliament that based on the feedback that the member of parliament got from her or his voters, how he or she should uh, vote, but it's rather one political party which decides, let's assume we are a parliament and you are all from one political party, and I'm the party leader and I tell you, and that's how they do it, uh, if there are a lot of amendments we voted, uh, please now for this amendment all vote in favor or, or abstain or all vote against because I or the, pol the, the, uh, the political party has decided that all of us vote in the same way. So that is also very often criticized as corroding the democratic principle because it's then not all of you who are elected, maybe from different regions, to that you don't represent those who have elected you, the voters, but that rather the political parties uh, have too much influence in that system. That's a criticism which we also recently could read uh, in, in newspapers, but that's the common system. If, for example, in Austria, if, part, if it's part of the legal system, it's not illegal. But, as, and that's what I want to make you aware of, also especially in this course, we should not only take the legal perspective, but there are a lot of perspectives which make it full circle that we should take. And uh, when in the core it sa states that democratic perspective is our perspective, yeah. then and that's why you can, and that's and that's why I have very good arguments of criticizing that situation, because you can truly argue uh, for you and maybe for a lot of others uh, that is a kind of I would say a breach but not fully respecting the essence of the democratic principle. Just to finish on that slide uh, what we have here as a first step is very often that uh, before the Commission actually drafts a proposal the Commission is actively seeking uh, the opinion of key stakeholders. So here we have what I previously coined rather in a negative sense, lobbying. The European Commission is also actively seeking the expertise from key stakeholders. Why? Because they just want to know, well, our ideas, would they, would they properly function in practice? Uh, sometimes they also just lack the expertise because they have no experts on, on, on certain uh, very specific issues. And so that's a very important stage which, which takes place uh, before the Commission actually drafts a proposal. And then obviously what I mentioned as lobbying can not only take place at this stage, but also then here at those stages, maybe even for the implementation. For all those stages there could always be lobbying uh, in the sense of trying to influence the stakeholders in a certain direction for example, in, term, in favor of the automotive industry, of whatever industry, at this stage, normally we, we don't find any uh, lobbying, as it was confirmed by a judge of the Court of Justice two weeks ago, but for all the other stages, there we would see the phenomenon of lobbying. So, as you can see, in, at this stage we have the three key stakeholders, the European Commission, the European Parliament, the Council of Ministers, and then for the implementation in the sense that to enforce it, also the Court of Justice in Luxembourg. In the afternoon, we're going, so at half past one, we're going to discuss the two videos uh, that you had to prepare, uh, which will give us more details on this decision-making process uh, at European level. Have a nice lunch break and see you at half past one.